Good, good morning and welcome to the committee's 15th meeting in 2019. Could I ask everyone please to make sure that their mobile phones are on silent? The first agenda item is subordinate legislation and this is to consider one negative instrument as detailed in your agenda. No motions to annul or representations have been received in relation to this instrument. Is there any member of the committee that wants to pass comment on it or is the uh, committee happy um, that they do not wish to make uh, any recommendation on this instrument? We are agreed not to make comment. Thank you. Therefore, move on to agenda item two. Uh, this item is to consider one affirmative instrument, the Public Appointments and Public Bodies uh, Scotland Act 2003, Treatment of South Scotland Enterprise as Specified Authority, Order 2019. The, cab uh, the committee will take evidence from Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Scottish Government. The motion seeking approval of the affirmative instrument will be considered at item three. Members should note that there have been no representations to the committee on this instrument. I would like to welcome from the Scottish Government, Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy, Karen Jackson, South of Scotland Economic Development Team Leader, Sandra Reid, the Bill Team Leader, uh, Felicity Cullen, Scottish Government Legal Director, and Fraser Gough, the Parliamentary Counsel to the Scottish Government. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make a brief opening statement of no more than three minutes? Uh, yes, well, good morning, and uh, I commend uh, everyone for their diligence. It's not often that one starts a committee meeting before light has fully dawned. Um, a, and thank you for the opportunity to say a few words about this order. The purpose of the draft order is to enable the appointments of members to South of Scotland Enterprise to be regulated by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life prior to the new body coming into effect in April next year. This is an absolutely essential part of the law surrounding the creation of South of Scotland uh, Enterprise, ensuring members have the right skills and expertise and ensuring that they are in place for the establishment of the new body in April 2020. As highlighted in your Stage 1 report, none of us are in any doubt about the importance of getting the chair and board membership right, ensuring it is made up of individuals with as wide a range of interests, skills, expertise and experience relevant to the South of Scotland as is possible. We want to ensure a diverse and strong field of suitable candidates and reach out in particular to those in the South. Equality is an integral part of the Scottish Government's business and as the Gender Representation and Public Board Scotland Act 218 is now in force, we will be working towards equal gender representation on the board. Our aim as members will provide a balanced mix of relevant skills and expertise which reflect business and communities in the south of Scotland. We also want to make sure, convener, that appointments are made on merit, following an open, fair and impartial process advertised publicly, and it is therefore crucial that we have the full participation of the Commissioner's Office in this process. This will ensure that appointments will be done on the same basis as Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise and other public bodies. The Commissioner's Office has been fully engaged in the process to date, enabling us to go live with the advert for the Chair appointment on 25th of April. In line with my commitment to the Committee on the 30th of January, and acknowledging the importance that you have placed on in harnessing interest in the new body, the advert, the advert is being widely publicised. It is crucial we reach out to attract people in the South and of the South. This means conducting a publicity campaign locally, including local newspapers, advertised publicly in a way that will attract a strong and diverse field of candidates. This draft order will ensure that the appointment process can be progressed with immediate effect over a period of time commensurate with this important task and with the full involvement of the Commissioner's Office, and I hope that it will receive this committee's support. I would be happy, Convener, to take any questions that uh, you or your members may have. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And there are some questions. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, I very much welcome uh, this approach uh, to make sure that we, at the earliest possible moment, start proper preparations for uh, the South of Scotland uh, enterprise body uh, in advance of the completion of the parliamentary process, um, noting in particular that the commencement uh, provisions in the bill before us uh, will clearly require uh, a commencement order to 
after uh, royal assent, and I'm sure that's uh, all in order for uh, April next year. However, we will, at stage two, uh, later this morning, be discussing a number of amendments that relate to uh, the way in which appointments are made to the board. And I, it would be just useful to me, at least, uh, to hear on the record uh, that the government in making appointments will, of course, take account of any decisions we make uh, on the amendments that we're going to be considering later uh, this morning. Uh, although I don't expect that it will be hugely material in the light of the, uh, uh, the remarks that the uh, Cabinet Secretary has already made. Yes, of course, I'm happy to give the assurance that, uh, uh, that we will take account, of course, of the changes made to the bill as at stage one. Uh, and I can certainly assure all members that will obviously be the case. Uh, um, with respect, I, I don't think that that is a factor that will, would impede the orderly process of appointment of a chair. Um, I think it's important to see this as a uh, as a sort of Gantt chart where we have a certain amount of time to, to proceed in a sequential fashion. Firstly, the, um, the uh, process of appointment of a chair, then when he or she is appointed, moving on to the appointment of a chief executive and board. And this must be done kind of sequentially and with the supervision of the Commission of Public Appointment. So, um, uh, so in order to meet the target date, convener of April 2020 for the fully um, statutorily established SOSI, South of Scotland Enterprise Agency, uh, will we require prior to that to put the building blocks in place. And that's really the purpose of uh, this, um, this a provision today. But I will specifically ask that the point that Mr. Stevenson has made will be brought to the attention of the selection panel just to make sure that the point made today is fully taken into account. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Are there any other questions from the committee? Then, I, then we can move on to agenda item three, which is formal consideration of motion uh, S5M17046 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy, calling on the committee to recommend that the Public Appointments and Public Bodies Scotland Act 2003 Treatment of South Scotland Enterprise as specified authority order 2019 be approved. Cabinet Secretary, uh, can I ask you to move the motion and ask if you have any further comments to make? Uh, moved and no further comments. Are there any comments from the members? The question, therefore, is that motion S5M17046 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. We'll now move on to uh, agenda item four, which is the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. Today we're undertaking stage two consideration of the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. The Cabinet Secretary and his supporting officials have stayed with us for this item. Everyone should have a copy of the bill as introduced and marshal list of amendments that was published on Thursday and the grouping of amendment which sets out the amendments in the order to which they will be debated. It may be helpful to explain the procedure briefly for anyone watching this. There will be one debate on each group of amendments. I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in that group to speak and to move that amendment and speak to all the other amendments in the group. I will then call on other members who have lodged amendments in that group. Members who have not lodged amendments in that group but may, who wish to speak should indicate by catching my attention in the usual way. If, it, if he has already not already spoken on the group, I will then invite the Cabinet Secretary to contribute to the debate. The debate on the group will be concluded by me inviting the member who moved the first amendment in the group to wind up. Following the debate on each group, I will check whether the member who moved the First Amendment in the group wishes to press it to a vote or withdraw it. If they wish to press ahead, I will put the question on that amendment. If the member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, they must seek the agreement of other members to do so. If any member present objects, the committee immediately moves to a vote on that amendment. If any member does not wish to move their amendment when called, they should say, not moved. Please note that other members, any other member present may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. Only committee members are allowed to vote, 
and voting in any division is by a show of hands. And it is really important, please, for members to keep their hands clearly raised until the clerks have recorded the vote. And I have asked for the next part of the vote. The committee is required to indicate formally that it has considered and agreed each section of the bill. And so I will put a question on each section at the appropriate point. I do hope that we can complete stage two today, but it really depends on how we get on. And uh, with that, I think we move straight to it. So, turning to uh, the, the actual bill, the first question I have to put to you is, the question is that section one and two be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore would like to call amendment 16 in the name of Colin Smith, group with amendment 17. Colin Smith, could you move the amendment and speak to both amendments in the group? Thank you very much, Convener. Um, amendment 16 uh, would require the agency's board to include the representation uh, from workers uh, in the region, most likely in the form of trade union representation. I believe this will help ensure that the region's workers have a voice in the new agency. The south of Scotland faces a number of significant challenges in areas such as low pay and job insecurity, uh, and the new agency will play a, a key role in tackling these, in, these issues. And I believe that representation of this kind is key to ensuring that these issues are consistently viewed as a priority for the new, new agency. I think it's important to, to note that there is precedent for this, and it occurs in other public organisation boards, such as uh, the case of Scottish Water. I don't believe this amendment will interfere with public appointments process as far as the final selection is concerned. That decision will still be made independently by the public appointments body, as with other members of the board. So this amendment simply introduces a requirement for at least one of these selections to be a representative of workers in the region. Amendment 17 would require the agency's board to have knowledge of the, the whole region as far as possible and an appropriate spread of skills, interest, experience and expertise. This just clarifies in the face of the bill what I'm sure everyone agrees with in principle. It will protect against the possibility of the board at some point inadvertently <coughs> ending up having representation, say, from one particular part of the region or area of expertise. A number of stakeholders raised this point with the committee and highlighted the importance of the board being genuinely representative of the south of Scotland. It's not overly prescriptive uh, in what this entails or how it should be achieved. It just enshrines in the bill the principle that the agency must be genuinely representative of the whole region. Thank you, uh, Colin. Before I call uh, other members, I just want to note for the record that Finley Carson has, has, has joined the meeting. So, I'm welcome. <laughs> Stuart, you, you, you had a question followed by Jamie Green. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, first of all, looking at uh, Amendment 17, I think uh, broadly uh, that makes a great deal of sense. I've got a very minor uh, concern about uh, B, where it says broad range of interest, skills, experience and expertise. The experience one, I'm just slightly doubtful about, and my reason is... I, I, it could be used as a way of um, making it more difficult for younger people to serve on the board. But, I'm not, but not to the extent that I want to oppose that amendment. I just make that as an observation for uh, the mover to, to, to have a think about. Uh, however, in 16, I've got slightly more substantial concern, uh, which uh, will not be uh, a surprise to uh, Colin Smith, uh, where in 1A he says, and representative. Um, I'm, I'm not greatly in favour uh, of boards of this kind uh, being boards that represent. In other words, the people who are there should uh, be interested in and further the work uh, of, in this particular case, South of Scotland Enterprise, uh, rather than being representative of anything. I'm certainly content that uh, the, the members be knowledgeable of the interests. And indeed, uh, at 1B, um, I, I, I think there's a reasonable point being made, uh, but unrepresentative uh, is, is, is something which makes me disinclined uh, at this stage, at least uh, until I've heard what others might have to say uh, to support uh, number 16. Thank you, Stuart. Jamie Green, followed by John Finney. Uh, thank you, convener. And uh, thank, thanks to Colin Smith for his uh, amendments uh, throughout. I think there's a healthy debate to be had on, on, on some of his points. Um, I, I, like uh, Mr Stevenson, I think uh, there is uh, a merit in Amendment 17. Uh, I too had reservations about the word experience. I did wonder if that 
putting it on the face of the bill would be very prescriptive in terms of ruling out potential candidates. I hope that is absolutely not an unintended consequence of Mr Smith's amendment. Uh, but nonetheless, I think on the balance of the whole, it, it, it would be wise to support Amendment 17 because I think it's important that we do uh, bring in uh, experience and knowledge from the whole of the south of Scotland and not from any one uh, area of it. I think that's the feedback that we got. Um, and I, I would urge members to, uh, to support uh, Amendment 17, but ask the member to reflect on, on the wording of it thereof. On 16, I, I equally share uh, Mr Stevenson's concerns and would be minded not to support that amendment. Uh, I don't think that boards should be made up of representatives or representative groups in that structured sense. Uh, I think it's important that the board membership uh, is given the freedom and flexibility to uh, be as uh, inclusive as possible uh, and, and that absolutely at the core of it should uh, represent both the uh, employees of the agency but also the uh, wider uh, public in which it operates with. Um, so for that reason I, I would not support Amendment 16. Thank you Jamie. Uh, John Finney followed by Mike Rumbles. Uh, thank you Convener. Um, I didn't quite envisage this, this line of debate like many around the table. I, I've been a a member of various boards and one of the first things that happens is you're advised that regardless of the basis of you being in the board, you represent the interests of the board. I don't see any conflict at all with what Colin's uh, saying there. Colin's not suggesting that that, or unless he tells me the country, suggesting that that rule is. I think he's really setting the parameters of the, the person to fulfil the role that he's outlined and I think very well outlined about um, representing the interests that have been said. And, and, and as Colin rightly points out, that this is not a... a a uh, first um, Scottish water is correct. So I wouldn't. I would ask members not to get hooked up in the word and appreciate that many of the the things that all parties seem to say in the chamber about wanting um, um, uh, fair work uh, approach adopted in relation to to all of our deliberations to to manifest itself, and I'm supporting that. Um, likewise, I'm relaxed about 17. Convener. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Mike Rumbles. Yeah. Uh, in, um Amendment 16, I'm just not comfortable with a special place being reserved for anybody. Um, I, I think it's too restrictive. I would, of course, like to see people on the board with, um, who have this uh, experience um, as a worker, whatever that actually means. Um, and I'm just, just not happy with the, with the approach of, of giving a special status within this. So I won't be supporting uh, Amendment 16. And uh, with Amendment 17, I'm not quite clear what Colin means in subsection A, has knowledge of the whole of the south of Scotland. What, what does he mean by knowledge of the whole of... I wondered in his summing up, just to help me whether I decide whether I vote for this or not, to me it seems to be nebulous. Um, I don't understand it. Um, so, why are we putting this into the law? Mm. Thank you, Mike. Does any other cabinet secretary would you would you like to put us? Uh, uh, yes, thank you, convener. I'm grateful for Mr. Smith in lodging these amendments to give us the opportunity to debate these matters. I think that's that in itself is is a, a good thing to do. Um, and I was listening with care to the contributions of members of the committee. Um, I'd point out that the bill in um, Schedule 1, Part 1, Paragraph 1, Subparagraph 2, already makes provision that in appointing members, we must be satisfied um, that they have knowledge or experience relevant to the discharge of South of Scotland's enterprise function. So that's already there in, in the bill. Given the wide aims and powers of the agency, that already ensures that members will bring wide-ranging skills and experiences. Um, however, I, I do recognise the need to take every opportunity to ensure that the board is diverse and knowledgeable about the south of Scotland. We are committed to increasing diversity of our boardrooms. Um, I, I am, on balance, happy to support Amendment 17. Um, however, having heard the comments of Mr Stevenson, Mr Green um, and Mr Rumbles uh, with regard to you know, probing the precise meaning and significance of the words experience and knowledge, we will, in accepting Amendment 17 at this stage, if the committee is so minded to support it, of course, uh, 
a, give further consideration prior to stage three to see if there is any further technical drafting needing, needed to deal with that. Um, so I'm grateful for Mr. Smith to, uh, for having lodged that. Um, I have sympathy with the intention behind um, Mr. Smith's Amendment 16. Um, understanding workers' perspectives will be important to the agency, including in the work it does to promote inclusive growth. It is, after all, operating in an area where there are, uh, have been traditionally low wages and relatively few well-paid jobs. So there should be and will be nothing to prevent someone representing workers' interests um, a being appointed to serve as a member of the new agency, appointed, of course, on the basis of merit and in accordance with the proper selection process. However, um, convener, there are other groups who could also lay claim to expecting a specific appointment to represent their interests. I just mentioned a few, you know, business, farmers, forestry, textiles, young people, and indeed older people. So if one starts off in the, on, the, on the argument that all of these sectors, very important though they are, should have a specific voice uh, on the board, then, you know, where, where does one... Where does one start and where does one stop? I think we need to balance what's desirable in practice with what's appropriate to expect in terms of securing a broad range of interests, skills and experience. And I think I'm mindful of the fact that the numbers on the board, are, a quorum is five? And six. Six and maximum is ten. I think that's right, ten. Ten plus chair, yes. Ten plus chair. So it's not a huge board, that's the point I'm making. It's not a, a board that, like other public bodies, would have the ability to perhaps reflect a, a very wide balance of, of interest uh, groups. I think it's also questionable whether such appointments should be as representatives of particular groups when these are individual appointments, convener, with members appointed, each on the basis of their skills, experience and expertise. But what I will do um, uh, and what I undertake is that adverts for members' appointments set out the desirability of attracting applications from uh, those who may represent workers and indeed some other groups I've mentioned where those individuals also feel they have the right skills and knowledge for the role. And we'll look carefully at how and where we advertise uh, a, a convener as well. So I would ask um, Mr Smith not to press Amendment 16, uh, um, but uh, uh, we will uh, be minded to recommend acceptance of 17 uh, subject to a further analysis of it, um, which we can bring forward if necessary at stage three for consideration of Parliament. Okay. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Colin, can I ask you to wind up, please? Thank you very much, Convener. Um, on Amendment um, 16, I believe it is important that the agency with this remit has appropriate input from workers. This is important as a, a point of principle, but as well as that, I think it will help the agency in achieve its broader aims, inclusive growth, safeguarding employment and promoting social development. I think people in the south of Scotland will be deeply concerned that this approach is used for one body, such as Scottish Water, but people perceive it as not being appropriate for... Um, I'm happy to take an intervention. But... Sorry, it's, it... I'm happy to take an intervention. Yes, <coughs> Jamie. Yeah. Th thank you. I, I, wasn't, I was just checking that we are able to cross debate. On, Abs on, but... Absolutely, if you thank want you. to come back in. Um, I, I just wanted to ask the member, um, how do you define what is a representative of the interests of workers? Because the, as, you, as you've drafted it, it said it must ensure that at least one person appointed is knowledgeable and representative of the interests of workers. Now, you've defined workers uh, as, as the Employment Rights Act 1996, but how do you define who is representative of? Anyone could make claim to be represented of. It could be a, a trade union, it could be a, a, a body of organisations, a chambers of commerce. And doesn't that open up to many people laying claim to wanting to have that right to be on the board? <coughs> Colin. I fear with the, um, the appointments process, which will be independently by uh, the public appointments body, uh, and they will have to determine that, the, that any member they appoint to the board meets the criteria it's set out. I think it's very clear in, in point 1B, and the wording in the amendment that before inviting applications for the appointment, Scottish ministers must consult bodies representing workers, for example, uh, trade unions, um, or the interests of workers in the south of Scotland about the particular interests, skills, experience and expertise required for a person to fulfil the requirements of 
uh, paragraph 1A. So I think it's set up very clearly that there will have to be a process of, of consulting and then ultimately the appointment will be made by the public appointments body. And this, as I've already stated, it happens in other public boards uh, within Scotland, such as um, Scottish Water. Uh, I'm slightly concerned that the Cabinet Secretary seems to suggest that because the board membership will be relatively small, um, anywhere from six to ten, that this may in fact mean that a representative of workers may not be on that body. And I think that is uh, an issue of, of, of concern, given that the commitment to uh, the whole issue of, of fair work. In terms of uh, amendment... Yeah, I'll take an intervention, yeah. Um, John, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm grateful for the member taking an intervention. I wonder would the member agree with me that, um, given his knowledge of the trade union movement and representative organisations, it's highly unlikely, given the extensive range of skills that these individuals hold, that the sole criteria that would lead to their selection would be that. But nonetheless, it's an important factor that should be considered. I think Mr Finney makes a, a very valid point. I, I want to touch on the issue of... Um, some members implying that, 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 that there's a concern over the representative of the interests of workers in the south of Scotland. It's very clear that, that members who sit on a board of this type are there representing that board when they make those particular decisions. And I think that's an important point that should be bearing bear in mind uh, when considering this amendment. I think supporting this amendment sends a very clear signal that the government and parliament is committed to the fair work agenda uh, and doing otherwise, I think, undermines that, that, that commitment and certainly that's one of the reasons why, for example, the STUC are, are, are very supportive of this particular amendment. In terms of um, Amendment 17, the only observation I would make is that I think it's important for members to, to look at the wording of the amendment when it refers to the, the board membership being taken as a whole. So this is not implying that every single member should have particular um, experience, uh, therefore ruling out young people. It's about the membership of the board as a whole. And I think that there was a very specific reason why this, was, this wording was put into the amendment to make sure that, um, that, that we're not overly prescriptive and it's about the range of the membership of the new border. And one of the important points that's been stressed by stakeholders in the south of Scotland is, is almost, a, if you like, a, the need for a geographical spread. Now, every single community in every single part of the south of Scotland cannot have membership of that board, but it's important that we, ha we have a spread across the region that represents not only the, 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 the interest, skills and experience and expertise of the region, but the geography of the region as well, I think, will be an important point to, to consider that we cannot have a concentration, say, on the, the large urban towns, it needs to have um, that, that experience from across the region. Um, but I would stress that this is about the membership of the board being taken as a whole um, uh, in this particular amendment. Thank you, Colin. So can I ask you please whether to press or withdraw your amendment, please? I'm happy to, to press both amendments. Okay. So th the question that we move on to is, is amendment 16, are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed, therefore there will be d a division. Those in favour of the amendment, please raise their hands. <coughs> Two. Those, those against? OK. Thank you. Uh, the result of the vote on Amendment 16, uh, there are two votes for, there are nine votes against, there are no abstentions, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I therefore want to call Amendment 17 in the name of Colin Smith, already uh, debated with Amendment 16. Colin Smith, to move or not move? Uh, to move. The question therefore is Amendment 17 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore would like to call them Amendment 18 in the name of Colin Smith in a group on its own. Colin Smith, to move and speak to Amendment 18, please. Thank you very much, Convener. This amendment um, clarifies that staff working within the agency must be covered by the principles of fair work as set out in the fair work framework or, or any framework uh, in this area that succeeds. <coughs> uh, again, I think this is simply stating in the face of the bill a principle that I would hope uh, all members would support. Uh, as a general principle, public bodies should be delivering good standards for their staff, uh, and this needs the agency to be setting a good example on working conditions, given the role it will play in promoting these principles among enterprises within the south of Scotland. Uh, so I'm happy to, to leave uh, my comments at that, um, convener, and I'm sure that other members will have views. OK, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, obviously, the Fair Work 
uh, framework that's referred to uh, is something that's very much welcome and, uh, and, and spells out uh, something I would very strongly wish to support. Um, there is just a, a technical issue around using uh, that specific reference in the amendment, however, and that is that as far as I'm aware, and I'm quite prepared to be corrected if I'm wrong, um, the Fair Work uh, framework has not been laid before Parliament. And therefore, at some future date, were a court to be having to look at this piece of legislation, um, and depending uh, upon the Fair Work uh, framework for the decision it might make, it will not necessarily actually be able to access that Fair Work framework in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. Um, if Colin had instead extracted from the framework um, those particular parts that he thought were relevant to the bill and put them in the amendment, I think that issue would not necessarily arise. We would then be dealing with a different issue. Um, so on that basis, I'm unlikely to be able to support 18. I just in passing, convener, I know it's in another group, there is a further reference to Fair Work Agreement in Amendment 21, uh, to which the same remarks would apply, and I probably won't repeat them when we get to that. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Rich Love, followed by John Finney. Yes, I, I'm not inclined to support this amendment either, and basically I'm reminded that an SNP government actually established the Fair Work Convention and has supported the Fair Work, uh, Fair Work Framework. And I think the government also published an action plan to achieve the aim by 2025 and has gone further than any government in regard to Fair Work First. And I don't think there's an issue with supporting the concept of Fair Work through the actions in those agencies. But it may be once the Cabinet Secretary comes in, they may be able to advise us how this agency might help achieve for people living and working in the south of Scotland what the expectations are of the new enterprise board in regards to this. And would he agree that, uh, with the greatest respect to Colin Smith, uh, that himself and the Labour's commitment to these issues might have been more credible if they had supported, previously supported our efforts to have employment law devolved? And a bit, they're a bit late converts to this cause, but I welcome them. But there are issues for this parliament and government to legislate on employment law matters uh, in regard to the comments made by Mr Stevenson. So I won't be supporting this amendment. Thank you, Richard. Uh, John Finney, followed by Jeremy Green. I fear for not the first time, convener, we're going to hear a, a, a procession of speakers saying how they're very keen to support workers, but then not support uh, principles that would, would do that. If um, Mr Stevenson's correct, then can I suggest that as a committee that we ask for the Fair Work, uh, um, Fair Work Framework to be published. We can look at it. If there's a will, there's a way. This is an entirely reasonable... Uh, going to take an intervention. Happy to take an intervention, uh, Mr. I just used the very particular word laid rather than published. Uh, there's a legal difference. Because it is published. Yes, right, OK, thank you. Well, then, if there is a will to have the principles pursued, then it should be laid, whatever the, 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 the difference is. Because the uh, reality of the situation is uh, that this is, a, this is a very modest ask, in my opinion, a very modest ask. And, and if there really is a will to, to have the principles delivered, then the mechanism should be put in place. So much as the, the, the Cabinet Secretary was pragmatic about something that, uh, as I understood, he, he had perhaps some reservations about, but said he would adopt the principle and bring it back refined at stage three, if that's the case, then I, I would like to see this applied here, and I think there's not unreasonable expectation that this should be supported. I certainly will be supporting it. Thank you, John. Uh, Jamie, did you want to come in? Just briefly, um, I, I, it's probably a question for the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm interested to know if all public bodies and their employees are, will be by default covered by the government's fair work framework, and if that is just a matter of principle or policy, or if that is a statutory requirement that of public bodies as part of the T's and C's of public body employees will naturally be covered by such convention or whether it does need to be prescribed on the face of a bill. And by prescribing on the face of this bill, does that by default set a precedent for other bills which affect other future public bodies by uh, inherently stating that they also must adhere to that specific principle which is a principle of the government of the day and also have reservations around attaching terms and conditions to a body uh, which is not yet set up 
and linking that to another piece of uh, legislation which has not yet been laid and which indeed may change in future. Um, and I think there's a risk there too. Thank you. Thank you. And, and the Cabinet Secretary will get a chance to answer that when, when he makes his comment rather than just now. So uh, I'd like to move to Mike Rumbles. Mike. Your mic, sorry, mic. There you go. Sorry, your mic wasn't on. To continue. Right. I'm just concerned with this um, amendment that uh, if, for instance, Fair Work Framework changed in the future, that uh, and the government didn't like it or somebody didn't like it, uh, we'd have to come back to this as, as primary legislation because this is primary legislation. I, I would like to hear what the minister in his summing up and his contribution to this uh, amendment, what, what he thinks of that. Um, is that going to cause the government a problem? Um, because it, it, it looks, I mean, looking at this, that it might, but I would like to know from the minister whether that's the case. Um, if there's no other questions, I'm going to go straight to the cabinet. Uh, Finley, sorry. No, just leave it. It should come on. Uh, Hold on. You, Wait. Pause. Next one over. Next. There we so, go. Thank you, convener. Uh, whilst I, I commend Colin Smith's uh, objectives in this, I, I do have concerns, uh, and, and perhaps again the, the cabinet secretary can answer this. I'd be concerned that if indeed the, the, the fair uh, work framework did change from what was published in 2016, how that would be addressed in the future to ensure that terms and conditions and such like wouldn't be outdated in the future. Okay, thank you, Finlay. I think now I've picked everyone up. Cabinet Secretary, uh, if you'd like to uh, make comment. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Convener. Thank you for members for the contributions to the debate. Uh, can I start off by saying that, that it was this government that has established the Fair Work Convention, and this government supports not just the Fair Work Framework, but has published a Fair Work uh, Action Plan uh, and is now also committed to Fair Work First. So um, I think it is self-evident that we are supportive of efforts that have been described by Mr Smith and others to take forward the concept of Fair Work through our actions and through our agencies. And it's the way that we do it to get it right that matters most. And that's what we're intent on doing. So. Um, I do want, however, to, set, to make it absolutely clear, convener, that our expectation is that this new agency will be an exemplar in this area. That, that is the, the aim. So there's, there's no, um, I don't think there's any difference between the aims set out by Mr Smith and others. Uh, uh, it's a question of how we achieve that. I just make that point. Um, and I fully endorse the vision of the Fair Work Convention and fully expect that the uh, agency will give appropriate consideration as an employer to what it will do to achieve that vision, and that by 2025, people in Scotland will have a world-leading working life where fair work drives success, well-being and prosperity for individuals, businesses, organisations and for society. I think it's important to spell out that's what we're trying to achieve here so that people perhaps following this debate will clearly understand what we're all talking about. Um, now, there are mechanisms to achieve this, and primary legislation does not appear to be the best or indeed the, the correct way to do it. Mr Stevenson and Mr Rumbles have made fair points that if a piece of primary legislation refers to a document which, as Mr Stevenson said, has been published but hasn't been laid before Parliament, uh, then what happens if that document has changed? Mr Rumbles made that point. Then primary legislation may need to be changed. It's difficult to change primary legislation. We need to come back to go through this whole process again. That surely would not be an advantage, but it would perhaps conceivably confound the aims that we are seeking to achieve. Secondly, there are mechanisms to achieve this convener. Primary legislation is, it has its role, uh, but uh, the main role and mechanisms for the new agency to achieve these objectives will be the operating plan, the employment manual for staff, and it will become, like Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, an accredited living wage uh, employer. I mean, this is a relatively new area of policy. I think it was last autumn that the First Minister announced it, and she has driven it forward herself with her vision 
convener, it is one that needs to grow organically to make sure it is implemented properly, and that will take time. But we expect the new agency to establish the five dimensions of fair work, effective voice, opportunity, security, fulfilment and respect. And I will give further consideration to how we impart these expectations to the agency in its role as an employer. But I do have significant concerns about this amendment as it is drafted. It asks ministers and the parliament to legislate on terms and conditions between employers and employees. Now, this is something which we believe we cannot do because these matters are reserved to the UK Government within the Employment Rights Act 1996. And as members know, there are dangers and pitfalls in legislating on areas which are reserved. Uh, 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 I would want to answer Mr Green's point, I think. Um, the Fair Work Action Plan, published on 27 February, sets out how we will deliver our ambitions on fair work. Uh, and in short, um, a, this is using the Scottish Government's agreement with the civil service trade unions as a model for getting public bodies, which was his question, and the relevant trade unions to sign up to a joint commitment to embedding fair work within all public um, bodies. So, um, to conclude, convener, um, I agree with the aims. There is a will to answer Mr Finney, and there is a way. It's just a different way from the one that Mr Smith has proposed. So, I... Yes, I'm happy to do that. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for taking the intervention. If there is a will, will, will the Scottish Government bring forward um, proposals at stage three that would well, encapsulate the, what Mr Smith is trying to achieve? Well, uh, we, we will, of course, reflect on the content of today's debate very carefully indeed, because we, there, there's no um, difference in aims. This is the policy that we set forward. We own this policy, if you like. We own it together with uh, those who support it and we want to develop it in a consensual fashion across the board. But the way to implement it, we believe, is through the methods that I've already described, uh, such as the operating plan, the employment manual for staff, and such as a letter of strategic guidance that will be issued to the new body by ministers. These are the mechanisms that uh, are deployed and have already been accepted, I understand, by the Labour Party in previous legislation when this matter has been debated before, before this parliament. Uh, so I hope, uh, a convener, that Mr Smith welcomes what I have set out, welcomes the clear commitments that we have given and will not press his amendment, which on legal competence grounds this Government cannot support. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And Colin, can I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please? Th thank you, convener. On, on the final point by the Cabinet Secretary on the legal basis um, for the amendment, this has been accepted um, as a competent amendment by the Bill team. Uh, it has been legally competent. Um, or it wouldn't have been um, before us today. I mean, on the issue of employment law, the amendment doesn't change employment law. It simply places a duty on the new body, which happens to relate to working conditions. Clarifying the body's responsibilities in relation to its own staff is very much within the scope of the bill and within the, the scope of this parliament. In terms of the wording, I believe it is drafted in a flexible enough um, way that it would not become outdated as things move on regardless uh, of this, I think it sets out a floor rather than a ceiling when it comes to uh, basic um, terms and conditions and, and rights that, that, that workers employed by the new agency should have. The, 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 um, the wording of the amendment makes reference to, as the Scottish ministers may prescribe, therefore if they do change parts of the, the Fair Work uh, Convention and Fair Work Framework, um, it would allow the flexibility to incorporate these, um, these changes. If the objections to this amendment are purely technical, then what I would say is I would urge members to, to pass it, to get the principle on record uh, and work. Happy to Cabinet Secretary, yes. Uh, th thank you. I, I, I'm reluctant to intervene, but I felt it important just <coughs> to say that I've been advised that the legislative team, legislation team in the Scottish Parliament do not assess questions of legal competence. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary Colin. The, the point I made very clearly um, to the, the Cabinet Secretary is that this amendment has been accepted uh, as a valid amendment. Um, it has the full support of the STUC, whose legal advice uh, is maybe slightly different from the Cabinet Secretary's, but hopefully the Cabinet Secretary, if he has legal advice that implies there's a problem with this particular amendment, he may want to publish that legal advice. Um, the STUC are 
partners or were partners when it came to the issue of fair work, and they fully support this particular uh, amendment, and I hope that that partnership will continue um, in the future. And as I've said, if um, the objection to this amendment is purely technical, then I urge members to pass it to get the principle on record, and let's work on uh, a final wording at stage three uh, to develop an amendment that would address some of the concerns that have been uh, raised um, uh, this morning. So can I ask you to press or withdraw the amendment? Yeah, I'll press the amendment. Okay, the question therefore is amendment 18 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed, therefore we, there will be a division. Those in favour, please raise your hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. Thank you. Uh, the result of the vote on an amendment 18 is there are two votes for, there are nine votes against, there are no abstentions. Therefore, amendment 18 is not agreed. The question, therefore, that I have at this stage is schedule one be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now, I have a further question and that section three be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Right, I would now like to call amendment one in the name of the cabinet secretary with, grouped with amendments two to six. Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to move Amendment 1 and speak to all amendments in the group? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, thank you, Convener. The amendments in this group apply various pieces of public bodies legislation to South of Scotland Enterprise, uh, so that what applies to the existing Enterprise Agency also applies to the newest one as well. Amendments 1 and 2 are technical amendments in consequence of the others in the group. Amendment 3 applies sections of the Further and Higher Education Scotland Act 2005 to South of Scotland Enterprise to ensure that various education bodies, including Scottish Further and Higher Education Funding Council, have the same duties and power in relation to the new agency that they already have in relation to Scottish Enterprise and HIE. Amendment 4 will ensure that ministers can issue directions to the agency about development of Scotland's water resources in the same way that they can issue directions to existing enterprise agencies. Amendment 5 will add South of Scotland Enterprise to three provisions of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015. The additions ensure that the new agency will have the same role in relation to community planning and asset transfers as the existing enterprise agencies do. Finally, Amendment 6 uh, will ensure that the new agency is subject to the duties of all public bodies relating to reporting about climate change duties compliance. Again, this will put it in the same position, convener, as existing enterprise agencies. Therefore, I move Amendment 1. Thank you. Uh, Peter Chapman. Peter. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, I will be very brief. Uh, I can support all these amendments. I think these amendments are mainly technical changes that improve the both the reading and the, and the implementation of the Bell's objectives. Um, I, I think that the, some of this uh, has come forward as a result of the, the Committee Stage 1 report. And I welcome it. Um, so I, I would be uh, minded to support all the amendments in this group. Okay. Uh, no other members of the committee wish to uh, comment. So, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to wind up, please? Um, I have nothing to, to add. I agree with Mr Chapman's comments. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. The, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 2 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. The question, therefore, is Amendment 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That question, therefore, is, is Section 4 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendments three, four, five and six, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments three to six on block. Moved on block. Does any member wish to object to a single question being put on amendments three to six? No. Okay. As, thank you, Richard. If, as no member objects, the question be, is that amendments three to six are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, therefore, I ask the question that scheduled to be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I now, for, I now call Amendment 7 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with other amendments as, as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary, to move Amendment 7, please, and speak to all amendments in the group. Cabinet Secretary. This, uh, this one. 
Uh, thank you, a Convener. The purpose of Section 5, which is the AIMS section of the Bill, as the Committee recognises in its Stage 1 report, is to set the direction of travel for the agency and to give it a clear mandate from Parliament without being overly prescriptive about how it allocates resources and determines its priorities. I know members understand the need for a careful balance in this section, illustrating a range of activities that the agency could undertake to deliver its aims, whilst enabling it to be both flexible and responsive. The worst case scenario convener would be for South of Scotland Enterprise to consider it could not act on a matter because its advice, its legal advice was that its aims were so tightly drawn as to prevent that issue or growth opportunity being taken up and progressed. That obviously is not the sort of legacy I think any of us would want to bequeath to this fledgling enterprise agency. We should also be mindful that this is an enterprise agency primarily there to foster and support uh, uh, sustainable economic development, jobs, investment and businesses. Clearly, we want to provide clarity for the new agency on how we expect these to be delivered. And we should not forget that other legislation will continue to apply. Uh, we don't and we shouldn't duplicate things that already are law. So we should be cautious about where other statutory functions exist on a matter so as not to overlay them with a different wording here, which convener could be interpreted differently uh, from the original legislation on the same matter, leading to all sorts of potential difficulties. That's a technical, but I think obviously a, a, an important matter. Nonetheless, the agency should be given in law a clear set of aims that Parliament wants it to have. I've listened to the calls for the Bill to say more on those aims, uh, especially in relation to environmental matters, and I hope members will welcome my amendments in this group, as indeed I welcome many of theirs. I'll speak to amendments in my own name first, and then convene a turn to those of other members. Amendment 7 is a technical amendment that simply paves the way for my amendments in this group and those of other members. Amendment 8 emphasises the agency's role in supporting e economic growth that is sustainable as well as inclusive. It responds directly to the committee's call for the bill to make specific provision about the development of a sustainable economy. This government absolutely supports sustainability, not least in environmental terms. Amendments 9, 10 and 11 continue the environmental theme emphasising particular issues that the agency might look at in its work to improve the environment of the south of Scotland as part of its work to build a sustainable economy there. I acknowledge and welcome Colin Smith signing on to Amendments 9 and 10, <coughs> and I'm happy to accept his Amendment 11A to my Amendment 11. I would, however, like to ensure that the wording there is appropriate to deliver our aims on this and would be happy to liaise with Colin Smith to agree whether any technical or drafting changes are required in advance of Stage 3. I'm also happy to support Stuart Stevenson's Amendment 23, Richard Lyle's Amendment 24. These highlight the critical importance of both physical and digital infrastructure. These have been mentioned by many, many consultees uh, to the uh, uh, initial stages of consideration of this bill. And these highlight the critical nature of um, these matters. So tackling those challenges faced by communities and businesses uh, in the south of Scotland was a key theme that emerged from our pre-legislative consultation engagement, and it continues now, convener, in the work that we do. So we must acknowledge that this is not the primary function of the south of Scotland enterprise, nor take the existing functions, particularly over transport, away from Transport Scotland, where they primarily lie, uh, and regional transport partnerships and local authorities. So, important though they are, there's no need for Section 5 to mention transport and, inf and uh, digital infrastructure twice, uh, having, uh, if the committee is minded to accept both Mr Stevenson and Mr Lyle's amendments. So I invite Mr Smith not to press, a, a, therefore, Amendment 25. Now, I acknowledge that Section 5, 5 to um, F was too tightly drafted in its original form. This is about community organisations. Um, and I welcome Amendment 14 from Gail Ross, which will demonstrate that support for communities to meet their needs will be considered in the widest sense and not limited to community organisations. If the committee is willing to support Gail Ross's Amendment 14, then I think, uh, in consequence, the need for John Finney's Amendment 15 falls. 
but I appreciate fully why he would want the enterprise agency to support such activity. In my view, Section 52F as amended now provides wide enough powers to support projects for community ownership and transfer without creating unnecessary duplication of existing powers and duties on local authorities in particular through the provisions within the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015. Communities should be able to expect all appropriate agencies to provide appropriate support to meet their aspirations. I hope Mr Finney would agree and not press his amendment and would accept my undertaking on the record that the agency will have powers and responsibility to support such activity. Colin Smith's Amendment 22 underlines the importance, Convener, of there being a range of business models that the agency should support, not least social enterprise and cooperatives, and the latter are particularly significant, particularly in the farming sector, the dairy farming sector in particular. I'm therefore happy to support his amendment, uh, and though, although again I'd like to ensure the wording properly reflects the intention and will advise if any technical changes might be needed um, at stage three and will advise um, uh, him of that. I'm not entirely sure of the thinking behind Claudia Beamish's Amendment 26. Um, I welcome her to the committee. I'll listen carefully to what she has to say and respond to her in closing. Turning finally to Mr Smith's Amendment 21 on fair work and Amendments 27 and 28 on inequality, um, I've, I won't duplicate repeat what I've said already. This government has brought forward fair work. We support it. Our support is clear. It is unequivocal. And uh, we have already indicated our expectations for this agency to, be, agency to be an exemplar and also the appropriate ways for this to be achieved in practice. Uh, I can also add, however, convener, which I hope is useful for the committee, uh, uh, the, the, that I've had the opportunity to have discussions with senior officials in the STUC recently, and I've undertaken to look at these matters very closely, although cognizant of, fa of the fact that elements of fair work are reserved, as I've already argued. Uh, so I undertake, um, convener at this stage, that I will offer meetings to any members of the committee uh, who wish to discuss this further, uh, as I've made that offer to the STUC and that offer will be to engage prior to stage three and indeed prior to the time when it is necessary to lodge amendments to stage three so that that engagement would come uh, in sufficient time for members then to decide whether or not they need to press matters by lodging amendments in stage three. So I was very keen to make it clear to committee that uh, we are working with the STUC. We're happy to work, continue to work with members on all these matters. In the light of these undertakings, I would therefore ask Mr Smith not to oppress his Amendment 21 on the basis I will look at this further, have further discussions with the Fair Work Convention and, of course, speak with him ahead of Stage 3 on it all once we have determined what, if anything, might be possible. I think we can all agree that amongst the issues holding back the economy in the south of Scotland, one of the most serious is continuing to be the low wage and gender, gender pay gap. Uh, uh, whilst government re research suggests this has improved, these matters are still serious, serious matters which persist, and this should not be the case in 21st century Scotland. It is my firm belief, convener, that the enterprise agency can only achieve the aims of sustainable, inclusive growth by tackling poverty and inequality and advancing socio and economic policy. In achieving these aims, convener, it will, by definition, tackle poverty and inequality. So clearly, as, the, as uh, the agency is a public body, will be subject to other legislation in this regard. And for that reason, I don't see the need to put these provisions a, a, in 27 and 28 on the face of the bill. And I wanted to say specifically, convener, that, the, uh, that um, there is existing law in regard to poverty, uh, uh, in regard to, to these matters. Existing statutory provision to achieve these aims already exists. The provision is contained within uh, the UK's Equality Act 2010, but also Scottish statutory instruments made thereunder. So as I said at the outset, these matters are already the subject of law. They're already subject to law passed by the UK Parliament and Scottish statutory instruments, 
I think it's very important not to duplicate things for the reasons I've mentioned earlier, such as the risk of creating potential overlap, confusion. Um, a, for all these reasons, uh, convener, I, I uh, would suggest that, uh, that Mr Smith do not proceed with amendments 27 and 28, but of course I will listen with interest to what both he and all other members say uh, on these matters. In, in conclusion, I move Amendment 7. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Colin Smith, I ask you to uh, speak to Amendment 19 and the other amendments in the group. Colin. Thank you very much, <coughs> Convener. If, if you'll oblige me, I'll, I'll just take the amendments in the, 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 the order in the grouping, which should make it uh, more straightforward to, to, to cover. So, in terms of Amendment 7, uh, tabled by the Cabinet Secretary, I, I very much support this amendment. I think it's a sensible change. The agency's uh, environmental remit, as well as its social remit, is, is one of the key differences from the current Scottish enterprise model they have. And I think it's right that we expand uh, more on what exactly that will entail within the bill. Uh, I think the committee were very clear uh, in our stage one report that in the balance between keeping our aims general uh, to allow, or keeping the agency's aims general to allow flexibility, um, uh, but also giving clear legal direction that, that the bill as it is currently drafted does not go far enough in giving that clear legal direction. So uh, amending the aims, I think, is, is, is important. Um, I therefore welcome uh, Amendment 8, which is uh, a clarification that recognises the importance of, of growth being sustainable. <clears throat> in terms of the Amendment 19 in my name. Um, this requires the agency to encourage the development of a sustainable economy as part of its aim. This was intended to highlight the importance of ensuring sustainability when the agency achieves its other aims. Well, I appreciate Amendment 8 from the, the Cabinet Secretary does make a similar point. I believe my amendment is more comprehensive um, as opposed to just growth. This calls for sustainability across our economy as a whole. And I think this recognises the need uh, for wider changes to make our economy more environmentally and economically sustainable and isn't just focused on the issue of growth. In terms of Amendment 20, uh, in my name, this requires the agency uh, to aim to, to increase um, the working age population as part of its aims. The outward migration of young people and the increasing imbalanced demographics of the region were raised by a number of stakeholders, and this was seen as a, as a major challenge facing the south of Scotland. This amendment is intended to reflect the importance of that issue in the region and to give the new agency responsibility to pursue policies that will help to address that. I think it's important to, to, to point out there's precedent for including this principle in, in primary legislation. If members um, think back to the, the Island Scotland Act 2018, it has increasing population levels as the first aim in the section setting out the remit of the National Islands Plan. So there is certainly precedent when it comes to uh, tackling some of the demographic challenges um, and population challenges facing um, our more rural parts of Scotland. In terms of um, Amendment 21, this, this requires the agency to further the principle of fair work um, as defined by the Fair Work Framework and promotes collective bargaining as part of its aims. Again, I believe this agency absolutely has a responsibility to try to drive up wages and working conditions in the region. I believe this should be clearly stated on the face of the bill. Dumfries and Galloway is the lowest paid region in Scotland and wages in the border are also, the borders are also below the national um, average. The region needs high quality, well paid, secure jobs and that should be a very clear a part of, of this bill going forward. I, I hear the comments of, of the Cabinet Secretary again, uh, and maybe he'll clarify in his closing comments whether he's proposing um, an alternative amendment as we move towards stage three that underpins the importance of this uh, on the face of the bill. Um, in terms of um, Amendment 21, in my name, and this, this amendment uh, is simply to clarify the need for support to social enterprises and cooperatives, as well as more traditional businesses. Social enterprises and cooperatives are of huge importance to the south of Scotland. And I think this gets to the very heart of the new model that's being proposed in this agency. It's not simply about supporting traditional enterprises, it's about that whole social element. And a key part of that are social enterprises and, and the cooperative model. So this adds um, that emphasis to the, the aims of the agency. Um, uh, 
very supportive of um, amendments 23 and 24 in Stuart Stevenson and Richard Lell's name. Um, they, they were obviously tabled around about the same time as I tabled an amendment um, uh, that, that tackles the issue um, of transport and, and digital connectivity. These are issues that, that um, were raised a lot during evidence. And you know, if I was to look at my mailbag as a South of Scotland representative, transport and digital connectivity probably make up a the most significant part um, of the concerns and issues being raised uh, by constituents. When we had the stage one debate and we took evidence from the Cabinet Secretary, I know he said he was concerned um, that the suggestion that transport and digital connectivity should be part of the aims of promoting them, should be part of the aims of the new agency, because this in some way uh, took authority or responsibility away from other agencies like Transport Scotland and, um, say, Digital Scotland. I do not think in any way does that, and I, and I welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary appears to have changed his position on that matter. This is about the new agency having a very clear leadership role. It's not about the new agency having responsibility to dual carriageway the A75. It's about that agency having leadership and driving the importance of improving our infrastructure in the region, infrastructure which I have to say is holding the region back. And that leadership role is absolutely crucial, I believe, um, to the, the new agency. So uh, happy to support amendments 23 and 24. And if they are supported by the committee, then uh, I, I won't move my own amendment, which covers the same areas, um, um, uh, amendment number 25. Um, I have no um, objection to um, the amendment from, from Gail Ross um, around changing community organisations to communities, but you know, I, I'll listen to what John Finney has to say when it comes to his amendment <coughs> A15 around community ownership, um, but I think it's important to, to, to stress that, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm I do not believe that Gail Ross's amendment goes far enough to enshrine the importance of supporting community ownership of land and other assets um, in the bill. I believe this is an important addition uh, to the bill. Um, it was highlighted in the evidence we took as a committee when we went to Dumfries, Callum McLeod uh, in particular highlighted that and pointed out that, that the Highlands and Islands Enterprise Working Community Ownership has I think been one of its huge successes and I think the new agency should have a similar support and role to play in the south of Scotland. There's around 500,000 acres of community owned land in the Highlands and Islands. In the south of Scotland there is 800 acres. There are some significant initiatives around the Mull of Galloway, around Loch Mabin Lock, but we are so far behind the Highlands and Islands in this that I think it's important to put in the bill. This is a clear aim um, for the new agency. I don't think that's prescribing uh, how the agency should set up, for example, a, a community land unit in the same way that Highlands and Islands Enterprise have, but it does give clear direction to the new agency that this should be a, an aim of that particular agency. I think it's also, we should be very clear that there's no expectation from stakeholders who have promoted this amendment uh, and supported this amendment that somehow the new agency will take over the Scottish Land Fund's responsibility in terms of funding, but it's about the new agency driving the issue of community ownership and also the ownership of other uh, assets as uh, well. Um, Colin, Colin I, I understand you have a huge amount of points to make and I, I'm, I know they're very important. What I don't want to do is, is limit the debating time for members to discuss the points that you and other members have raised. So if I could ask you to uh, bear that in mind as you continue what you're saying, please. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, in terms of the other amendments, there are obviously a number of significant amendments here that have a, a major influence on how this new agency will work. I very much support amendment number nine uh, in the, the name of the Cabinet Secretary. I think it's a welcome uh, amendment. Um, likewise, amendment number 10, um, about promoting the sustainable and efficient use and reuse of resources. The two amendments are very similar to amendments that I tabled but, but withdrew because the wording was slightly differently but I think had the same aim going forward. In terms of um, amendment number 11, the Cabinet Secretary's aim, um, I, I'm pleased to hear that the Cabinet Secretary is supportive of my amendment to his amendment, uh, which would change um, supporting the transition to a low carbon economy to supporting the transition to a net zero uh, carbon economy uh, and um, you know, if there are technical changes that are required to this I'm sure they can be made at stage three if this particular amendment goes, um, goes through. Um, very supportive of my uh, colleague Claudia Beamish's amendment number 26 and, and Claudia I'm sure will set out in detail um, how that would work uh, in practical terms. In terms of amendment 27 it, it does seem strange that we're supporting um, 
promoting and improving transport and digital connectivity within the south of Scotland, which we've has been argued isn't the main responsibility of the new agency, but somehow tackling poverty and inequality it shouldn't be an aim of the, the new um, agencies. I've already said the broader remit of the new agency, which includes social and environmental responsibilities, is a key difference from the current model and the model we have at the moment. And the issue of low wages is a massive issue within Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish borders. That's not to say that this will be uh, that the sole focus of this agency and not other agencies and not other legislations, but attracting those high skill, high paid jobs has to be a focus of the work of this new agency if we are to be serious about tackling the issue of poverty and inequality. Um, in terms of Amendment um, 28, um, again, yeah, well, to allow debate you know, on the things I would ask you to be as as concise as possible, please. I, I certainly do my best, Convener, but the, the problem we have is that most of the amendments are in my name, therefore um, it's difficult to have a debate if members are not aware what my aims are in, in those amendments. Um, so I'm happy to, to support um, uh, or to, to, to highlight amendment number 28, which I think sets, um, it's clear that the agency has a strong social remit that, that sits on a level playing field with its economic remit. And I think that probably covers um, most of the amendments. Um, uh, amendment number 29, again, in my name, enshrines best practice uh, in law and enshrines that the, uh, sorry, it's, it's gone too far. So I'll leave it at that, Convener. I think I've covered all my amendments uh, before your intervention. Thank you, Colin. Stuart, uh, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 23 and any other amendments in the group you wish to do so? Um, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, Colin uh, Smith referred to the evidence that we had on digital connectivity, uh, and I too heard it and uh, uh, tack tent of it, because um, having uh, digital connectivity that is of an appropriate speed and availability uh, is an absolutely crucial way in that more rural uh, parts of Scotland can be placed at an equal distance to urban areas from services that are delivered uh, uh, digitally. Uh, I think it, uh, notwithstanding the excellent R100 programme that will deliver uh, 30 megabits availability to every uh, premise in Scotland, um, it's worth perhaps my saying that the first uh, uh, digital uh, system that I worked on in 1969 ran at 110 bits per second and was adequate for its time. Uh, the 30 megabits we're now looking at is more than a quarter of a million times as fast. And in the future, the R100 uh, uh, delivery of uh, 30 megabits will undoubtedly be overtaken uh, by, by, by faster speeds and different technologies. So it rem will remain important uh, part of uh, uh, what the, the agency uh, must do. It is a vital uh, utility uh, for people living in the south of Scotland as uh, elsewhere. Um, and of course, it also, in definitional terms, covers uh, work that the agency uh, would uh, be likely to want to do on mobile hotspots, as well as uh, wired connections uh, for broadband. So um, the indications are that I think the committee will support this. In the event the committee does not support it, I would be entirely relaxed if instead they support uh, Colin Smith's uh, Amendment uh, 25. Uh, just a couple of words on two uh, two of the other amendments, I won't deal with them all. Um, I've said what uh, I said at uh, Amendment 18 in the previous section in relation to the use of Fair Work Framework, Fair Work Convention at 21. I think the same difficulties apply, and I won't re-rehearse them. Uh, and in 11A, I, I suspect in the light of uh, announcements subsequent to the submission of the amendment, we might see at stage three net zero carbon uh, being substituted with uh, net zero greenhouse gas emissions, which is a broader uh, term which would accord with what uh, the amendments that have been put forward for the climate change uh, uh, bill that's before uh, the, uh, the e e Environment Committee, of which I'm a member. Uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, that's my remarks, Convener. Thank you, Stuart. To Richard Lau, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 24 and any other amendments in the group, please? Thank Richard. you, Convener. Um, there are numerous amendments in this group which I will give consideration to when we come to, to, to save time. 
um, and I will only speak to my own amendment in this group. We know through the work of this committee and reinforced by our specific uh, evidence gathering for this bill how vital transport connectivity is for successful communities and businesses across the south of Scotland. My amendment 24 responds to those concerns, making it clear that the south of Scotland enterprise could undertake activity to promote improvements to transport services and infrastructure across the south of Scotland. In our consideration of the legislation, the committee recognised the need for uh, clarity of roles and responsibilities between agencies operating in the south. This amendment does not confer on South of Scotland Enterprise any existing statutory functions or duties such as those of Transport Scotland or Regional Transport Partnership. Instead, it ensures that new agency could complement those activities advocating for transport infrastructure services that support the inclusive economic growth of the South, which we all believe in. And that is what, what we have called for in our Stage 1 report, and I therefore move this amendment in my name. Thank you, uh, Richard. Gail Ross, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 14 and any other amendments in the group, please? Thank you, Convener. In the interest of brevity, I will also just speak to my own Amendment 14. Um, the committee has recently welcomed the remit for the new South of Scotland agency that includes social development, and the evidence that we heard at Stage 1 showed that there is wide-ranging support for this to be included. And it responded to the very clear need for support to help communities in the south of Scotland further their interests and meet their needs. But we also heard some concerns about the current wording in the bill at section 42 subsection C being too gnarly drafted as it only referred to community organisations. And this might inadvertently restrict the support offered and to whom that might be offered. And I agree with these concerns. And as the Cabinet Secretary has stated, in Amendment 14 adjusts the wording to make it clear that the support for communities which could be provided by the new enterprise agency is not intended to be restricted solely to community organisations, ensures that the agency can reflect and respond to the different needs and interests of communities across the area. And the broad scope of the section with my amendment, <coughs> should it pass, would allow almost any matter to be addressed, including community asset transfers and land ownership. Um, so I do also think that John Finney's amendment becomes unnecessary, but I heard what Colin Smith had to say, and I will listen closely to what John Finney has to say on his amendment. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his assurances um, in this regard, and uh, wait to see if John Finney thinks that this will suffice. Thank you, Gail Ross. I would now call on John Finney to a speak, speak to Amendment 15 and any other amendments in the group. John. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I think uh, what we're doing just now um, shows the importance of this building and uh, the role that committees play in scrutinising legislation. We all want to make good law, and we want to, to make law that um, is relevant, is not open to challenge. I absolutely accept that. And uh, the, the pressure we all face as elected representatives is lobbying from individuals who want their particular interest put on the face of the bill with some perception rightly on occasions, that if it's not expressly catered for, then uh, it's somehow devalued. Um, now, we all know that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, but some of the discussion around this, I have to say, I, I'm somewhat bemused about where we're um, commending the promotion of reserved issues, and as, as Mr Stevenson did there, and, and I have no, no, no issue with that. Um, uh, Gail Ross's uh, Amendment 14 doesn't cover what's required because, um, as we heard and we mentioned um, the issue of community land ownership, in our report we heard that uh, from Dr Callum McCout of Community Land Scotland that uh, part of the remit of the new agency should be to establish a community assets team within the agency similar to that operated by HIE. Now, we've made a lot of references to the uh, similarities and, and uh, lots of discussions around the powers. Can I tell you what our recommendation said? The committee further calls on the Scottish Government to amend the aim of, I quote here, furthering the economic and social development of the House of Scotland to make specific provision in relation to supporting community land ownership and asset ownership. That's specifically what I'm, I'm doing here. Um, and I, I would hope for um, support of the committee on that. 
Um, Colin's touched on the, the, the huge disparity there is between the issue of community land ownership in the south of Scotland compared to the high, highlands of Scotland, highlands and islands. And I would say that there perhaps is a historical basis to that. But if we really are, we know, for instance, the, the, the community ownership contributes to local economic development in both rural and urban settings by generating businesses, opportunities, employment and income streams for reinvestment by communities for their collective benefit. Again, that's from Dr. Callum McLeod. So um, the, there are opportunities. Um, it was referred to as a glaring discrepancy. The creation of South of Scotland uh, offers an opportunity for a, a step change. Um, if the Cabinet Secretary um, is... Uh, as he previously offered, saying that um, there are deficiencies in the wording here. I, I can't see how there are, but if there are, then I would hope, given that there's always been a significant platform um, and a commendable approach that's been taken by the Scottish Government into the change that's required in land ownership, then I would hope that this would be supported by members. Briefly talking about one or two of the others, I, I, I hear what has been said um, uh, in the repetition of some of the earlier discussion. I'm supportive of um, Colin's approach in relation to Colin Smith's approach in relation to a lot of these other issues. And um, given the time restraints you've indicated, I'll not go through them all, but I'm broadly supportive of all the others as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, before I go on to uh, look at the next amendment, I'd like to welcome Claudia Beamish to the committee. Uh, she joined us earlier. I haven't had an opportunity to welcome her, but having welcomed her, I now call on you, Claudia, to speak to Amendment 26 and any other amendments within the group. Claudia. Right. Thank you, Davina. I'm in the nick of time. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I'm very pleased to be here today and uh, want to just preface my remarks by saying how uh, important and significant I think this bill is in relation to the, um, to the south of Scotland, which I, I represent. Um, and I should declare an interest as a member of the co-op group of members of the Scottish Parliament. So um, I was pleased to hear the Minister say that he'll listen to um, what, I, what, what points I want to make um, in relation to this amendment, uh, which would again add to the aims, which is the section five we're looking at, and it, it would be to encourage persons and bodies with an interest in the environment to cooperate in, in achieving environmental objectives. This is a probing amendment, and it would relate to um, a whole range of um, bodies and individuals, uh, farmers, land managers, and communities, uh, actually both um, urban as well as rural, uh, uh, being enabled and facilitated in working together um, uh, for these aims and for this aim. And I would give you three quick examples. One would be um, on the basis, they're all things that it would be difficult for um, groups to do without support and advice um, and would encourage them to, to take things forward on an environmental basis. So one would be um, river catchment wide work. Um, actions, for instance, to mitigate um, flooding, such as riparian planting. Another would be for agroforestry schemes, which would enable action on, on a scale which makes it likely that tree planting across um, smaller um, land holdings might be possible in a way that it wouldn't be otherwise because of economies of scale. And another would be woodland planting, of which there are good examples um, near Peebles and in other places in... Um, in South Scotland by communities uh, already, but this would support and facilitate uh, uh, communities working uh, with, with advice from the agency. And I would stress that in view of the recent um, UK Climate Change Committee report and this week's um, UN report on nature and the shift to um, net zero emissions by 2045, which um, the Scottish Government, as we know, has now um, committed to, I'm delighted to hear, I am clear that this amendment adds to the aims in a way that would facilitate positive environmental objectives on a cooperative uh, uh, basis, and I look forward to hearing from the Minister on this. Um, I would also like to say that I support um, John Finney's amendment. I know I'm not a member of the committee, but I do think it's vital, having been on the um, uh, Rural Affairs Committee in the previous Parliament and having gone to gear and also understood about the support that has been given by High to 
communities who are looking to move forward, and I think it's very important that this is part of the of the um, of the bill. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you we much. have some other contributions. Peter Chapman, you'd like to, and then followed by Mike Rumbles. Thanks, convener. I'll try and be as brief as possible. Um, Amendment 7 and 8 in the Cabinet Secretary's name, no problem with that. And Amendment 19, likewise, from Colin Smith, which is, is very similar to Amendment 8. Uh, Amendment 20 in Colin Smith's name, I think I can support. It's, uh, it's obviously commendable that we try and get more working age people into the region. 21 uh, has already basically been debated already, the Fair Work Framework, so I, I, I won't be supporting that one. Um, 22, again, I have a problem there. It seems to be very restrictive in, in promoting cooperative societies. I mean, I, I, I would like to promote all kinds of business models, and, and, and I, I don't think I agree with picking out one. Um, Stuart Stevenson's Amendment 23, uh, I, I, I very much support, but I just have a, 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 a some kind of concern that, it, that we're committing the, the Enterprise, Enterprise Board to, to funding some of this. Uh, some of this work, and I don't believe it's uh, it's within the remit to, to fund. It's certainly within the remit to support and uh, and uh, encourage. And I will absolutely give way. I thank the member for giving way. Um, he, it, the word used is promoting, so I, I think that would be much wider than just financing, would it not? Well, that 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 is my point. If if that is the case, then I'm happy to support it. But uh, we need to be sure that it is uh, not being expected to fund. Uh, again, uh, Richard Lyle's uh, Amendment 24, I think it speaks about funding strategic review, so I think we can support that one. Um, uh, 20, as I say, uh, I cannot support Colin Smith 21, as I've already said, or 25, um, but I, I, I heard what he had said, that, that, that if, we support, if the committee supports 23 and 24, then he would withdraw 25. Gail Ross's uh, Amendment I can support. And I heard what the Cabinet Secretary said, that uh, that might mean that uh, John Finney's uh, 15 might be withdrawn, but I, I suspect John will push. And if he does, I think uh, I could support 15 as well. And with that, I will wind up convener. Thank you, Peter. Um, Mike Rumbles, followed by Jamie Green. Mike. Thanks very much, convener. I think it's, I don't think anybody has yet, but I think it's important that we recognise uh, what the Minister, uh, what the Cabinet Secretary has done. Um, in our stage one report, we specifically asked him to come forward with amendments on the environmental aims and everything else, and he's done that. So I will be supporting uh, the, the minister on these uh, in preference to any other approach. Um, and I also thought, I'd, uh, and I've said to several members privately when they've asked me about their amendments, that um, I would have an open mind and listen to the debate, in which um, I'm sure we all do, uh, but I've specifically got an open mind on this, and I would mind it before I heard John, to support Gail uh, Ross in her amendment. But from what John uh, so eloquently said, um, I think I will be supporting his amendment 15 um, because it is what we said in the stage one report. And, and I think that's appropriate that we do so. I have to say, I certainly won't be um, supporting John's other amendment that he brings forward later on, but I will certainly be supporting this one. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Jamie, I was, I was unclear if you wanted to come in or not. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, a lot's already been said in this group. It's a large grouping with 18 amendments, uh, and my colleague Peter Chapman's eloquently expressed our views on much of it. But I thought it is worth making a few quick general points <clears throat> for the benefit of the other committee members. Um, there is a bit of a, a choice to be made between amendments 23 and 24 on digital and transport infrastructure and Colin Smith's amendment <clears throat> also on digital connectivity and transport. Uh, and I think it really comes down to the nuanced wording of each. Uh, and I'm minded to uh, go in favour of 23 and 24 because they promote the concepts of improving digital and transport uh, rather than supporting the han enhancement of. And I think by default, the enhancement of uh, could be uh, read as having a duty or a role uh, to do something, and that requires a budget, which it may or may not have. However, uh, we, and I'm always mindful of the, this problem that we may have these debates, it's no surprise that the aim section is the biggest one, uh, because there are so many asks and demands of the committee and of the new agency 
that they want it to be as expansive and comprehensive as possible. And I think that's something we all share. I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary agrees. But the problem with lists is they become exhaustive or indeed non-exhaustive. And we've had this debate many times in this committee. Uh, so, I mean, I'm un uncomfortable with starting lists that we don't finish. But however, uh, we do have to be cognizant of the feedback that we had in the public meetings. And they were very specific asks around some specific elements around uh, uh, social enterprise, around uh, the environment, around uh, 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 digital and so on. So I think we will support some, but perhaps uh, not all of them. Um, I'm equally happy with uh, Gail Ross's uh, clarification on Amendment 14. I was a bit unsure at first as to the, the rationale behind it. And I think uh, I, I have come around like uh, Mr Rumbles to Amendment 15. Uh, and I think uh, our group would be mindful to support that as too, because it was in the Stage 1 report. And I don't think there's any problem in supporting community ownership. It doesn't say that there'll be huge swells of budget to give to organisations to buy pieces of land. But supporting is, I think, suitably positive and suitably vague in this respect, uh, that, that I would be able to support it. Um, I think it really comes down to the, the wordings. I think supporting and promoting are, are helpful words in these amendments, whereas when you put a direct duty on the agency, uh, that uh, inherently leads it down a path which it may not want to go uh, down. Uh, I think that is all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jamie. Uh, John Finney, followed by Finney Carson. Um, John. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I just wanted to speak briefly on Claudia Beamish's um, uh, Amendment 26 there uh, and to, to, to say I, I thought it was a, an excellent presentation that we heard there and it is about the challenges we all face collectively and, and, and I look forward to hearing the Cabinet Secretary's response to this because it is about dialogue and some of the examples given there it will be about the leadership that's shown in relation to that and about collaborative working so I hope to hear positive response from the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Thank you John. Uh, Finlay. Uh, thank you Convener. <clears throat> I, just, I just wanted to put on record um, that uh, my concerns are the same as Jamie Green uh, and also, uh, uh, John, with uh, the creation of lists. If we have too long lists and uh, there's certain uh, interventions that are not expressly mentioned, it could suggest that, that they're not quite so important and lists then become a bit prescriptive. Uh, uh, Gail Ross's uh, amendment, I certainly think, broadens the opportunities without concentrating on any one particular intervention. Um, I'm, I'm not sure why social enterprises and businesses should only be uh, emphasised if they're cooperative societies. Uh, I think Gail Ross's amendment would, would open that right up, certainly. On that, I, think, I think the wording of that particular amendment talks about social enterprise and cooperative societies, not only cooperative societies. I think it's an important point. Um, it's wider uh, than just cooperative societies. It's, it's all social enterprises, which is clearly a change in the, um, uh, the, the remit of this agency in comparison to, for example, Scottish Enterprise. I think it, it just my reading of it, it suggests it's supporting social enterprise and businesses that are cooperative societies. It suggests that it potentially excludes social enterprise and businesses that are not cooperative societies. Uh, so I, just, I think we need to be very careful about creating lists. Um, in Amendment 9, maintaining, protecting and enhancing the natural heritage, it could be argued that it should be enhancing the natural and cultural heritage. So it may be that we bring back further amendments at Stage 3. Thank you, Finlay. Uh, just looking around. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, could I ask you to wind up on this big group of amendments? Yes, I'm very pleased we've had a detailed discussion um, uh, a, uh, around the aims of uh, South of Scotland Enterprise, and it's, it's right that we give this full consideration, as Mr Finney has said, this, this is in a sense what, what we're here to do. Um, and I, although I don't support all of the amendments, convener, that have been brought forward by members of the group, for the most part I agree with the intention behind them, and as Mr Rumbles have said, we listened very carefully to what the committee said in its report and brought forward the amendments, particularly with regarding to the reflections the committee made and recommendations about the environment. So I was grateful for Mr Rumbles' comments on that. Uh, on issues such as equality and fair work, um, th these will be matters included in the strategic guidance letters issued to the agency. And I wanted to say, committee, that um, and they will also be dealt with in the, the strategic board's strategic plan. If it would be helpful to committee convener, 
I will write to you with a bit more detail about how strategic guidance letters deal with these. I will give examples of SE, Scottish Enterprise and HIE, and indeed the Strategic Board, stating and showing the way in which these important matters, these vital matters, are in practice dealt with, not in the face of legislation, but in letters of strategic guidance. I think that would perhaps help inform stage three, so that perhaps there's a clearer understanding of, uh, on all sides about how these matters can be dealt with in practice, but not on primary legislation. Um, I would encourage members to support Amendments 7, 8, 23, 24, 14, 9, 10, 11 and 11A, which will more clearly demonstrate that the activities of the new agency will balance a range of economic and social and environmental objectives to deliver inclusive, sustainable growth and sustainable development. Um, yes, yes, I will. Thank you. Um, can I just ask a quick question? Um, what the Cabinet Secretary's understanding is of the difference between Amendment 19 and, 9, and Amendment A, because they're, they're, they're similar, but one is adding sustainable to a list of aims for economic growth, uh, whereas the other is adding the development of sustainable economy to the list of aims. Uh, I guess there's a similarity in wording, but um, I, I'm unsure as to which achieves the best result, and indeed if the two are compatible. Yeah, um, well, we do um, not surprisingly prefer our, our, our own amendment. Uh, um, a, 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 and not for, for largely technical reasons, because the, the alternative, I think Mr. Smith's 19, um, doesn't quite express the, the aim in the most felicitous way. But we will reflect very carefully on these matters prior to stage three and, and come back. But that is our, our recommendation, having um, Heather too looked at the technical detail of all amendments very carefully. It's not really good versus bad. It's effective against slightly less effective. It's clarity versus potential vagueness. And I'll come on to illustrate, I think, some of these general points in relation to specific amendments in a moment. Um, I think we should bear in mind the bill has been drafted to provide flexibility with regard to the activity of the agency. And that was, I think, convener of recognised by the committee in its, in its report. And we want the new agency to be able to take a fresh approach, a tailored approach to meet the needs of the South and not, not be constrained by legislation or artificial boundaries. And many members uh, alluded to that as a desirable and indeed a necessary aim. If I just turn to some of the specifics, um, uh, again, Mr Finney, I think, set out aspirations that, and aims that, that we support. And he uh, has set out in Amendment 15 his proposals. The reason we prefer Gail Ross's um, Amendment 14 to 15 uh, is, a, firstly, that by accepting Gail Ross's Amendment 14, it will simply mean that the bill will provide that we are supporting communities to help them meet their needs. It's very simple, it's very straightforward. Supporting communities to help them meet their needs. Um, well, can I just finish the argument, and then I'm happy to give way both to Mr. Mason. I think Mr. Finney wants, perhaps wants to intervene, happy to intervene, but just maybe let me develop and complete all these arguments. Um, Mr. Finney quite rightly, and uh, I think others, I think Mr. Mason referred to a, the good work that HIE has already achieved in this, this field, um, and it has achieved these things, and the community land unit was alluded to as the operational way in which it gave focus to these issues, rightly so. But I just point out the legislation setting out the aims of HIE doesn't mention any of this at all. It was able to do this, this work in community land and support community land purchase, without that actually being referred to in its establishing legislation at all. It's precisely because the wording of the legislation establishing HIE is broadly worded that, the, um, that, that it is able uh, to act uh, in this particular way. So it is not necessary to specifically confer power in respect of the way in which Mr Finney's amendment seeks to do. Um, and in preferring Gail Ross's amendment, we are, are simply making a judgment about what is technically preferable. Um, and it's important to say that, so I'm not 
making, and I'll, I'll happy to accept all uh, interventions, convener, if, if members wish to, to raise further questions on, on these matters. Okay. C can we just go in the order that they arose, if, if we may, please? So it would be John followed by uh, John Finney followed by Mike Rumbles. Okay, convener. I I'm grateful for the Cabinet Secretary taking an intervention. I tried to fairly lay out group's aspirations regarding what would be on the, the face of the bill, Cabinet Secretary, and absolutely ready to accept that, and I will be supporting um, Gail's motion. It was part of our initial report on, on the basis of what we received. But I, I, I similarly, I can't say I have intimate knowledge at the moment, anyway, of High's initial legislation, but I'm quite sure it wouldn't include promoting digital connectivity, for instance, in it, because um, legislation evolves. Uh, our, our position evolves in relation to things. But th this is something that I quite frankly would have thought the Scottish Government would want to trumpet rather than have it contained in a generality. This is good news. This is, this is good news um, by the Scottish Government in relation to the Highlands and Islands building on... So uh, that's why I, I would have thought it would have been expressly catered for and that you wouldn't have a difficulty with it. Thank you. It, it, it may be appropriate to hear all the points raised and then come back, or would you like to do them individually? Um, I'll hear all and then answer if that's OK. Right. That, that seems the logical way. Sorry, it should have been John Mason first uh, and, and then Jamie Green. Sorry, Mike Rumbles and then Jamie Green. Thank yep. you, um, Convener. Yes, I mean, similar points to J John Finney. I'm, str I'm struggling a bit to understand why. I mean, I accept it wasn't in HIE's uh, legislation, community ownership of land and other assets, but I mean, it is something this government and our party is very committed to, and we've put a huge amount of money into buying Ulva, which I wholly support. Um, and we did hear in evidence that, whereas in the Highlands and Islands, there is quite a lot of community land ownership in the south of Scotland, there's virtually none. So uh, I have to say I'm very inclined to support this amendment uh, because I think it would be really underlying what we're trying to do. OK. Uh, Jamie, do you want to... Uh, Mike, Mike yeah. I think it feels the question's been asked as well, so... Jeremy, do you want to come Yes, thank you. And it was just picking up on the uh, comments made by the Cabinet Secretary. I don't think uh, Amendment 15 confers or even infers that the Ministers will have any additional powers. It simply does not state that. It just says supporting community ownership of land. Uh, now, we each and all have our own political views on, on that subject, but I'm, I think that's a fair and reasonable statement to make. I don't think it genuinely it deviates uh, in any way from a legislative point of view as to the powers that ministers may or may not already have, or that the agency may or may not seek to have, if they can use existing powers that exist elsewhere to uh, purchase land, it, it's welcome to do so. Um, but supporting, uh, again, we use that word in other amendments, which I think uh, the uh, committee uh, supports, um, I think uh, is, is acceptable. And I don't see the direct relationship between supporting community land ownership and the, the sort of powers that the Minister thinks this amendment may or may not infer. Cabinet Secretary. Well, OK, I'm, I'm grateful to the members for their points. I'll try to, to respond to, to each of, of them. Um, firstly, Gil, Gil Ross's amendment is wider than, than ownership, but it encompasses ownership. So Gil Ross's amendment, if it's accepted, will have the effect that the new agency, South of Scotland Enterprise, will be able to do what HIE can do it will be able to do everything that HIE can do. Um, and it is wider than ownership. There may be other ways in which communities may wish to be assisted than community ownership. So it confers a wider range of powers. I would have thought that it's desirable to uh, ensure that there is the widest range of powers uh, for communities, for example, that wish to pursue options other than direct ownership of the land they have. That said, we are completely committed, as Mr Mason has said, and have been uh, for as long as I can remember in my party, and that's uh, over four decades, uh, to community land purchase. There's no question about the aims. We're not saying, convener, Mr Finney's amendment is bad and another is good. That's not the issue at all. Uh, I mean, if the committee decides to go for Mr Finney's amendment, then I think we would have to look at technical amendments that would be necessary to avoid restricting the scope uh, of the new agency at um, stage three. I would certainly ask my officials to do that, to see if that were necessary. But I can um, assure, in response to Mr Green and Mr Mason, that, that the purpose behind our advice that Ms. Ms Ross's amendment is to be preferred 
is to do exactly what Mr Finney and others, and Mr Mason, and indeed Ms Ross, have said the new agency should be able to do. It will be able to do that, but it will be able, in my view, to do more, because the wording of Gail Ross's amendment allows it to do more. Uh, so the objection is entirely technical, convener, but that is the nature of drafting legislation. Uh, we are not uh, in doubt about political policies and the pursuit of them. The question is how best to implement and enable them to be enacted. Uh, so I'm um, uh, happy perhaps to, to, to park that one there and maybe turn to Claudia Beamish's amendment, if I may. And, and uh, firstly, could I thank her for, a re for um, coming to the committee and making this point. It's absolutely essential that um, everyone works together and cooperates together. But that's not really about the agency. Uh, and the bill does not really have its purpose of telling third parties what to do. It's not really the scope of a bill. I mean, obviously, across the whole scope of government, people need to work together, and um, that is expected and it's desirable, but it's not really the scope of a bill and any bill establishing a body to state that third parties should cooperate together. That's something that, is, that uh, should happen anyway. Um, and Yes, of course. Can I get me, get me the amendment? Good morning, please. My phone was on. Please, please carry on. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the point I'm making is not that they should um, uh, do this, but this is a permissive and facilitating and supportive amendment for um, groups who may not be able to have the capacity to, to do things collectively. So it's not that they should, but that they, they could. Well, you know, again, I support the, the, the aspiration, but the point I'm making is that this is not something that's really... Uh, suitable for containing in primary legislation. Um, how can we enforce what third parties do together? And indeed, the definition of encouraging persons and bodies with an interest in the environment is vague, because who is to say that someone has or does not have an interest in the environment? Arguably, everybody should have an interest in the environment. So that means everybody should cooperate with each other, which is not really to do with setting up the agency convener. So, again, in, in resisting, suggesting that members resist this uh, uh, amendment, I'm not in any way opposed to, and I agree with the, the aim, but it's not really one that's habile to be included in primary um, legislation. However, on... A, yes, I'm happy to do that. Right. I thank uh, the Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention. Given that things in relation to the environment are moving at such a rapid pace, I wonder if the uh, Cabinet Secretary would, before Stage 3, perhaps take on board um, a way of redrafting um, some of the amendments to take account of the climate emergency that we have now declared we're facing in Scotland. Yes, I'm, I'm very um, uh, pleased to give the assurance that, of course, we will, prior to stage three, look specifically at that issue and in relation to um, Ms Beamish's amendment, and I hope she would accept that assurance. Um, and moreover, um, the, the bill in various parts does import a duty to consult. Uh, that's very important. And that duty to consult will, I think, bring about what Claudia Beamish wishes to achieve. And indeed, I think we will come on to debate Maureen Watts' amendment 39 shortly which proposes, I think, just that in a particular context. So I think the way in which to achieve what Ms Beamish sets out to achieve is achieved by other means. Uh, and if she agrees with me, and given the undertaking I've provided happily to Maureen Watt, uh, as to you know, the bigger specific picture of meeting climate change and the new agency being able to do so most effectively, uh, I hope that uh, she wouldn't uh, press her amendment. Um, again, I fully recognise Colin Smith's desire to emphasise the importance of the new body tackling inequality and poverty in the South. I addressed this uh, in my opening remarks, but I don't think that Amendments 27 and 28 are the right way to achieve that. Um, and I would urge the committee, for the reasons that I set out earlier, and I, I won't repeat, uh, a, not to accept those amendments if, if they are pressed, uh, but I would reiterate the undertakings I've given previously, convener, to come back to the committee 
uh, and indeed individual members, as well as the STUC, in good time before stage three to have further discussions on, on these matters, which we are happy to do. Um, uh, aside from the drafting, I think there is enough in the aims, should the committee support my Amendment 8, to allow clear direction to be given on wider government priorities like tackling poverty and promoting equality. Uh, and I would also specifically undertake to do that in the agency's first strategic guidance letter. Um, I think the, the last issue, I, I think the last issue that was raised in the debate I wanted specifically to talk about was the debate between the transport uh, options, uh, one promoting and the other supporting. Um, the reason, convener, we used the word promote was after careful internal deliberation with Transport Scotland, with, you know, obviously lawyers and others, and we felt that the word promoting ha was the best word to use in respect of the role that this new agency should have and the option of supporting the enhancement of uh, had an element of vagueness because it could import an obligation financially to contribute to matters which are the actual responsibility of other bodies. I think Mr Green set out the difference between the two quite well and I entirely agree that, um, that uh, the, the uh, option with promoting should be preferred uh, because I think it correctly encapsulates the role that stakeholders wish this new body to have and it should have without encroaching on the legal and executive responsibilities of other bodies, uh, including Transport Scotland. So um, I wanted, you know, rather than just to read, it, read, it, read all this uh, stuff out, which I've written earlier, to try to respond to members' concerns. I'm grateful for them having been raised, I hope. Uh, that this collaborative consensual discussion will lead to uh, improving the bill convener and um, whatever the committee decides, we are very happy to continue to work with all members uh, to get the best possible bill uh, and uh, to achieve that, to progress that work prior to stage three. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And I'd li now li like to move on to look at the amendments. And the first question I have is that amendment seven be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore would like to call amendment in the eight in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 7. Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move or, or For, formally moved? Thank you. The question therefore be is that Amendment 8 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I'd like to call Amendment 19 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 7. Colin Smith, to move or not move? Let move, convener. Thank you. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 19 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. Therefore, there is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Okay. Those against? Thank you. The result is that there are five votes for, six votes against. There are no abstentions. Therefore, Amendment 19 is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 20 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 7. Colin Smith, to move or not move? Yeah, move, convener. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 20 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I call Amendment 21 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 7. Colin Smith, to move or not move? Yeah, move, convener. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 21 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. We are not agreed. Therefore, there will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Thank you. The, the results of that vote are there are two votes in favour, nine votes against to uh, Amendment 21. Therefore, it is not agreed. I therefore would like to call Amendment 22 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 7. Colin Smith, to move or not move? Let it move, convener. The question, therefore, is Amendment 22 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. Therefore, there will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Oh, sorry, could you keep them hands raised? Sorry. It's very helpful if you raise them high. 
um, might say, uh, thank you very much, Richard, <laughs> for demonstrating yeah, that. Like thank you. Those, those against, please raise their hands. Thank you. The, 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 the results are that there are eight votes for, three votes against, therefore Amendment 22 is agreed. Uh, I therefore call Amendment 23 in the name of Stuart Stevenson, already debated with Amendment 7. Stuart Stevenson to move or not move? Move. Uh, therefore, the question is that Amendment 23 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 24 in the name of Richard Lyle, already debated with Amendment 7. Richard Lyle to move or move. not move? Move, Kandina. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I call Amendment 25 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 7. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, not move, Kandina. Uh, Colin Smith seats... No, sorry. Sorry. I move straight on to the next one. Sorry, therefore, I'm going to call Amendment 14 in the name of Gail Ross, already debated with Amendment 7. Gail Ross to move or not move? Move. The question, therefore, is Amendment 14 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I call Amendment 9 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 7. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. The question, therefore, that Amendment 9 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 10 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 7. Cabinet Secretary to move forward, Formally please. Moved. Thank you. The question, therefore, that Amendment 10 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 11 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 7. Cabinet Secretary to move formally, please. Formally moved. Uh, therefore, I'm now going to call Amendment 11A in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 7. Colin Smith to move or not move? Let move, convener. The question, um, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 11A be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to press or um, withdraw Amendment 11 as amended? Uh, press. Yeah. Yeah. Press. Yeah. Press. OK. The question, therefore, is Amendment 11, as amended, be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I call Amendment 15 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 7. John Finney to move or not move? Move, convener. Thank you. The question, therefore, be Amendment 15, be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. Therefore, there is division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. The result is those in favour of Amendment 15, those for vote... Sorry, I'll get this out in a minute. Votes in favour of Amendment 15 are eight, votes against three. Therefore, Amendment 15 is agreed. Uh, I therefore, call Amendment 26 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 7. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? I will move, Convener. Thank you. The question, therefore, is be Amendment 26 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. Therefore, there will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. Thank you. The results are three votes in favour, eight votes against, no abstentions. Therefore, t Amendment 26 is not agreed. I'd like, therefore, to call Amendment 27 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 7. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, move, convener. The question, therefore, will be, uh, is that Amendment 27 be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. no, we are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. Thank you. The results of that vote are there are two votes for it, nine votes against. There are no abstentions. Therefore, Amendment 27 is not agreed. I call Amendment 28 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 7. Colin Smith to move or not move? It move, convener. The question would be that 28, Amendment 28 be agreed. Are we all agreed? 
We are not agreed, therefore, is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. The results of that vote are there were two votes for the amendment, nine votes against, therefore amendment 28 is not carried. The question, therefore, at this stage is that section 5 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I'd now like to call amendment 29 in the name of Colin Smith, grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Colin Smith, please move amendment 29 and speak to this amendment and any other amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. I'm happy to move amendment 29 in my name, which simply sets a, a if you like, a, a requirement for the new agency to ensure that it reviews its action plan on an annual basis. That's not a commitment that it has to change that action plan if it concludes um, that it still uh, meets its requirements, but simply to carry out an annual review to make sure it is up to date. And I think this uh, simply enshrines best practice in law and ensures that the action plan can't simply for be forgotten for years to come. Um, the amendment number 31 uh, in my name um, I think requires the agency to consult local authorities while developing their action plan. I believe this is a sensible provision which will ensure there is local consultation during the development of the action plan itself. Um, amendment number 32 in my name um, requires the agency to submit its draft action plan to local authorities for comments. There's a, an amendment from John Mason that requires the action plan to be submitted to Parliament, which I think is perfectly reasonable, but I think it's also important that there is local input uh, to that action plan, and therefore my amendment uh, requires the agency to submit its, its draft plan to local authorities for comments. In some ways, this is an alternative to the approach that I've set out in Amendment Number 33, which I'll speak to in a moment. But it's an effort to ensure that local authorities have an opportunity to give feedback on the action plan uh, as we get towards the end of this process. This, ideally, along with the consultation requirements set out in Amendment 31, will provide useful insight from local authorities and help ensure that the agency works with uh, and in partnership the two local authorities. Um, amendment number 33 requires the agency's action plan effectively to be agreed by local authorities as well as Scottish ministers. This is a, effectively a stronger version of Amendment 32 requiring local authorities to sign off the action plan. Again, this is to guarantee local input and collaboration between the agency and local authorities. I think some kind of mechanism giving local authorities a chance to respond to the, the action plan is crucial, uh, but I'm happy to take a steer from committee on whether that should be a statutory right to comment or a requirement to be um, sp specifically supportive of that action plan. It's worth noting that there is precedent in law at the moment for that particular proposal. At the moment, the local plans from the police and also from uh, Fire and Rescue have to go to local authorities for sign off at the moment. So there is a, a precedent there um, for, for that particular type of process. Amendment 37 follows on from this amendment. And, and one of the weaknesses around the sign off process for the police and fire service at the moment is that although they, their local plans have to go to local authorities for sign off, there is no mechanism in place should a local authority say they don't agree with that particular local plan. That was an issue I know the Justice Committee highlighted very recently. So what Amendment 37 in my name does is ensure there is a process should there be a, a dispute, if you like, between the local authority and the new agency, although um, it, it's a, an issue that, that shouldn't um, arise if, if both organisations are working um, closely together. Um, 34, Amendment 34, in my name, requires the agency to engage with the, the local communities on a regular basis to gain feedback on its performance uh, and receive views on what it should be doing in the future. I, I believe there should be a requirement um, for community consultation set out in the face of the bill. I, I don't think it's good enough to simply say this is best practice that will happen anyway. I think it's important that we underpin that uh, with a legal requirement. And I've said it a few times today, there's no downside to enshrining best practice in legislation. It cl provides clarity in what is expected and helps to future-proof the principles that has driven the establishment of this agency. This amendment is not prescriptive in what this consultation process should look like, given the agency flexibility and how to approach it. It simply clarifies that as part of their responsibility to keep their action plan under review, they should regularly consult with the local community, gaining feedback on both their performance to date and their work moving forward. I'm aware that, that Maureen Watt is proposing something similar with Amendment 39, and while I, I do not think an amendment would 
Um, I do think her amendment certainly would improve the bill. I believe the requirement for regular consultation set out in my amendment is maybe more appropriate than a requirement to consult specifically only on the development of the action plan itself. Um, amendment number 35 in my name expands upon Amendment 34 by clarifying that local authorities, businesses, third sector bodies, social enterprise, etc., uh, and trade unions should all be consulted as part of the agency's community engagement. I believe this provides some additional clarity on what is meant in Amendment 34. Um, this list is by no means exhaustive, but rather a starting point to make clear the proposed scope of the consultation, in addition to the proposed requirement to consult those living and working in the south of Scotland in Amendment 34. Uh, each item on that list has an important and unique perspective to inform the work of the agency and this amendment would make clear that they should be included in the consultation process itself. Um, amendment 37 um, and my name follows on from Amendment 33, and I think I've covered that in my comments um, earlier. Th amendment 38 um, requires the action plan to be revised at least every five years if it's not been revised in this time. Uh, as with the requirement to review the plan annually, this simply sets a floor in terms of how regularly it must be revised. It's not unreasonable uh, a time frame, and indeed I'd hope the plan is revised uh, regularly enough that this is never used. And again, there is precedent uh, around setting a time scale when it comes to reviewing a plan. Members are aware of the passing of the forestry uh, bill that was um, uh, driven by th this committee uh, and a timescale, a specific <coughs> timescale was included in that bill uh, when it came to um, revising um, the, the forestry strategy and I think it's important to set that timescale uh, so that it, there is a, a, an upper limit as to when that um, should be revised. I think um, convener um, yeah, I think that's all the amendments um, in my name. Sorry, no, apologies. Um, no, I think, actually, that's right. Yeah, I think that's all the amendments in my name. I'm happy to, I, I think happy to cover is, them. Yeah, there's uh, indeed. There's quite a few. I appreciate that. <laughs> OK, uh, therefore, I'm going to call on Maureen Watt to speak to Amendment 30 and any other amendments in the group. Maureen. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, as we took evidence on this bill, we heard loudly and clearly that, that people across the south of Scotland wanted to shape the work of their agency. They are excited by the opportunities it will bring for growth, but they want to ensure that their voice continues to be heard and the agency listens to their views and their priorities. Enshrining this approach in the bill was something that we as a committee wanted to see. My amendments 30, 36 and 39 do that. Amendment 39 will require the new agency to consult on its action plan, including the development of a new or modified plan. It goes further and ensures that the agency sets its consultation strategy, making clear who and why it will consult. This gives local people a formal channel through which to provide feedback on the performance and strategic focus of South of Scotland Enterprise Agency. As such, it will enhance both the accountability and transparency of the new enterprise body. Amendments 30 and 36 are technical amendments to make all this work. Amendment 30 flags the consultation duty section. Amendment 36 makes clear that consultation must take place on modifications as well as replacing an action plan. Like Colin Smith, I agree that it is important that local authorities are consulted, but unlike Colin with his amendments 31, 32 and 33, I don't think that their voice should have primacy, nor should they be given any sort of veto over the plans. Nor do I think that Scottish ministers should prescribe through regulations who the new agency should consult. I think that is best left to those in the south of Scotland. I'm also reluctant to see timetables for review prescribed in this bill. Public bodies are already required to do this. I don't think we need to make additional provision for this new agency. I believe that my amendments strike the right balance. They strengthen the bill by clearly providing a greater role for the people of the south of Scotland in shaping the new agency. And I would ask members to support these amendments. And I move Amendment 30. Thank you very much, Maureen. Um, and now I'm going to look to other committee members. And the first one I'm going to call is Stuart Stevenson. Stuart. Uh, 
Th thank you very much, Camilla. Uh, Amendment 29, uh, which basically requires an annual review of the plan. In other words, the whole shing bang has to be looked at every year. Now, it, it's worth saying in the draft uh, bill that's before us at 6.1c, um, the power is created for Scottish Enterprise to, it may modify its action plan at any time, subject to Scottish Ministers approving it. And I, I think that's appropriate. I can see, I can see that uh, South of Scotland Enterprise may well wish to make amendments in a, in a time frame of a year or indeed less. Um, but, but I think given uh, the whole wheen of consultations and so on and so forth um, that, that Colin Smith is proposing through his various amendments, an annual review uh, would uh, carry the very real danger that South Scotland Enterprise uh, spent all its time reviewing its plans, uh, whereas its real objective is actually to support uh, economic development, etc., etc. So that, that, that's the general point. Uh, looking at uh, Amendment uh, 35, um, I've got concerns about the specific uh, wording in there, in that uh, at 2D uh, B, it says businesses operating or otherwise having an interest in the south of Scotland. I just don't know how you would find the answer to that, um, the, 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 because it is all-encompassing. It appears to create a duty on, on them finding all businesses that operate or otherwise have an interest. And I just think that's impractical. And with the same token, at C, third sector bodies and D, trade unions, the same uh, observation would apply. Um, and looking at 38, um, we're at uh, 5 in 38, the insertion of 5. If it is not previously modified its action plan in five years, basically then it must modify it. Well, it might be a brilliant plan and it may not have needed modification in five years and if it didn't need modification in five years, well, fair enough, it doesn't need modification. Member um, take an intervention on yes, he will. Uh, Thank you. I'm curious at the approach that, that the member takes to this bill and the approach he took to the forestry bill in which he voted in support of the government amendment that set a timescale on when the um, forestry strategy should be um, reviewed and amended, uh, but somehow he thinks that that shouldn't apply to the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm simply looking at what's in front of me here. Uh, I don't, I, I confess absolutely to have the words that uh, related to forestry in front of me, so I can't make that comparison. And I'm, I'm sure uh, Colin would not mislead me in that regard. But the bottom line is that if a plan is the plan you need, I'm not sure why statutorily you would require it to be changed, um, because the change that you would then have to make might be artificial. Now, it's about the wording. I, I, I suspect very few plans would survive years without being five years without being changed in the real world, but it's just a slightly odd wording. Um, I'm, I'm happy to support my colleague uh, Maureen Watt's amendments. Kimura. Thank you, uh, Stuart. Uh, next, uh, Jamie Green. You want to come in, Jamie? Thank you. Thanks, uh, convener. I'll try and rattle through these uh, in uh, some form of cohesive manner. Um, can I take 29 and 38 together? Because I think uh, it's topical at the moment. Um, I, I don't have a problem, actually, inserting an annual review. I think it's the sort of thing that the board naturally would probably do anyway. Um, but I don't think there's any harm in putting it in statute that they have to do it. Now, that doesn't mean that they spend the whole year doing a review, nor does it necessarily mean that the review means it must change every year. It doesn't say that. It just says they must cast their eyes upon their plan at least once per year. And I'd like them to do that. And I think that's an expectation that they would have. Now, it could be that that review simply says that we're happy with the plan as it is and we'll keep calm and carry on, in which case they've done the review and it's signed off appropriately. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a navel-gazing, laborious piece of work. So therefore, I would support 29. However, I'm listening. I was originally mindful to support 38 in the same respect, but I do read the technicalities of it, and I do have a concern that what if, at the end of the five-year period, uh, the plan has not been modified because the board sees no need to modify the plan? Um, it could very well be that this is a long-term plan that after review, the annual review, which I support, after the fifth annual review, we're at that stage where 
the board has continued to continue on the path that it is going. Therefore, would, there would be no need to modify. I do wonder on a technical level if Amendment 38 requires them to modify it. So I'm sympathetic to the aims, I think, of what Ms Smith's trying to achieve. Just in a second. I think I'm, I'm sympathetic to what you're trying to achieve by it, but I wouldn't want any unintended consequences to put uh, a duty on the board in the future to do something that it doesn't need to. Happy to take an invention. Colin, uh, you, you'll get a chance, obviously, sure, to comment sure. on it when you wind up. So, if it's a brief comment, I was just keen to know um, why the member's approach um, was maybe slightly different to the approach taken in the forestry bill, where the wording okay. uh, is exactly the same in the forestry bill as the wording I'm proposing. The timescale is different, I have to say. The timescale is different. And I remember we had that debate, but just one, the wording is um, exactly the same. OK, well, this isn't the forestry bill, for, first of all. This is an entirely different bill from an entirely different agency with entirely different objectives. We're perfectly entitled to take different views on the wording of the bill. Um, but I see his point. Um, it, I appreciate you've, you've, you've taken a similar wording. I, as I said, I, you, well, you can maybe think about it as other members speak, but I, I'm still unclear as to if at the end of the five-year period, this would mean that, uh, that, 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 that the, the enterprise agency would have to modify its plan or not. Or could a modification be a continuation of the plan, in which case I'd be happy to support 38. And you could maybe reflect that in summing up. Um, on some of the other amendments in this group, I think, again, it comes into a, a bit of a, a choice of camps, and that's the amendments put forward by Maureen Watt and some similarly worded amendments by Colin Smith. Um, I'm sympathetic to, to both, um, but I'll, I'll, I can outline my position on them. I, I would be mindful to support uh, amendments 30, 36 and 39 uh, from Maureen Watt, because I think they, they, they provide the sufficient consultation that I think people are looking for in the south of Scotland. I think by being too prescriptive and uh, including, uh, I think it's important to include local authorities, but I think the feedback that I've had from speaking to people in the south of Scotland is that they don't want local authorities to have a veto over the agency's uh, decision making. Uh, indeed, some people were very adamant they didn't want any local authority involvement whatsoever. I think to be sympathetic to local authorities' role in the south of Scotland and the important role they play, I think they should absolutely be part of the consultation process. Um, I think, therefore, uh, Colin Smith's amendments to that effect are uh, perhaps too, too prescriptive and binding on the role that they would uh, play. Uh, and I think, lastly, uh, is uh, I think I would say that if, although I don't support amendments 35 and 37, if they were to pass, there are other uh, amendments uh, later in other groupings, which I think are technically linked to these two, namely 45 and 46. So even though we wouldn't support 35 and 37, if they pass, we would support the technical tidies up. Um, I'm, I'm, however, uh, pleased to tell Mr Smith that I support uh, Amendment 34, which I think sets a, a, a more general and, and perhaps less prescriptive view on who should be considered uh, 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 in terms of the, the board's activities. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, John Finney, you're next. John. Yeah, thank you, Kavina. Um I like plans. I read a book about the Soviet Union and a, a dairy farm where they used to have monthly production plans and people liked the break from monotony, so they had fortnightly production plans and they became very popular too, so they had weekly production meetings. And the phrase I recall from it was, um, eagle-eyed zealots uh, um, were always on the lookout for anyone who would seek to put a plan into practice. And therein lies the problem with a lot of this. I think it's entirely well-meaning. But I, I, despite what's being said, I do think that the focus will be, if not by, certainly won't be by the whole cohort of, of workforce, but a significant part of the workforce will be populating plans to put in here to gather dust on shelves or to occasionally be referred to. So I think there's a balance to be struck. <coughs> um, I'm not going to speak to all the amendments, but I, I, I think in this instance... Um, I think Maureen's got the balance right, and I'll be supporting her amendments. Thank you. John uh, Richard Lau. Well, in reply to my colleague's comments in regard to communism, I don't think it worked out very well, did it? Um, so, basically, the situation... You can, we can all... You can have a, a company can have a plan, but in the daily running of any company, there has to be flexibility. And, basically, um, most companies do have a plan... Don't, you know, maybe review it. And when I was in the council, we continually, planners continually reviewed and reviewed and reviewed plans. And sometimes nothing got done, as far as I was concerned. 
So basically, um, yes, have a plan, but you've got to have the day-to-day -day flexibility in order to ensure that your plan works. And that's what uh, being a businessman or being an entrepreneur or being uh, an official within a, a business, that's what you do every day of the week. And as a boss said to me when I worked for the Royal Bank, you have to look at the bigger picture. Okay. And I think, um, I think Cabinet Secretary, uh, it's now down to you to give the bigger picture. Well, <laughs> well thank you. Well, I'll try to, to, to rise to that occasion then. Um, you know, I'm grateful for members for the contributions to the debate. I think we all want to achieve the same thing. And indeed, I'm mindful of the fact that the committee asked us to do this at stage one. It asked us to find a way better to consult the people that live and work in the south of Scotland. So I welcome Maureen Watt's amendments 30, 36 and 39. Indeed, if she hadn't brought them forward, I might have been minded to do so. Uh, they ensure that consultation with people across the south of Scotland will continue by introducing a specific requirement for the new agency to consult with local people. I think, Convener, you know, that really was what the committee wanted us to do in principle. That is what we believe should be done without enfankling the new agency in a, an overly burdensome um, framework of rules and regulations which are overly prescriptive. Maureen Watt's amendments are less prescriptive than, for example, 34, um, which is at the same time prescriptive, um, Mr Smith's Amendment 34, but also vague because it says it must regularly seek representations from people. It doesn't actually define uh, and that's not particular criticism of Mr Smith, but it doesn't really say what regularly means. If there is vagueness in legislation that allows people to argue different things and becoming enmeshed in side issues is never a good thing. Um, Mr Smith's amendments 31 to 32, 33, 37, 46 deal with consultation with local authorities. And I think the main reason for not accepting these is that they would actually effectively give local authorities a right to veto plans. I don't think that is something that the committee wants, nor actually do I think local authorities have, as so far as I know from my frequent engagement with them, I don't think they would wish that either. No local authority should be able to direct an agency for the whole area about its plans. A, the, the real desire is that the local authorities and the new agency work together. I'm very confident that will happen, uh, convener, because of the will that exists for that to happen. But I would urge members to reject these uh, 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 well-meaning, well-intentioned amendments from um, Mr Smith. Um, prior to stage three, and in order to try to be as helpful as possible uh, on this key issue of accountability, we'll consider any further specific proposals that members wish, may wish to put to me. So the onus is on members, but if there are any further thoughts after stage two, then I give the undertaking that we, we will carefully consider them in the same way that we will collaborate with others. Um, I want to turn to the timetable uh, and the timing issues. Um, I think I should, should um, point out that all public bodies are required by the Scottish Public Finance Manual, which applies to public bodies, to review their corporate plans every three years. That, that is a requirement across the board. Um, uh, they are also required by the Finance Manual to produce an annual business plan. So the, these are the rules, the, the rules that apply to Scottish Enterprise HIE. Um, I, I don't think there should be a disalignment, a disjunct between the other enterprise agencies and the new agency. I think it should be bound to operate in the same way with regard to review and business plans as other public bodies. Um, and we have made clear to these other bodies we expect them to align their planning cycle to a common three-year cycle, a not different three-year cycles as well. So, yes, I'm happy to do so. I'm, I'm just a bit confused, sorry. Are you saying that the current enterprise agencies have a one- or three-year review of either its action plan or, its, or, or you know, which plans are reviewed when? Because as it's currently worded, um, 29 asked for a, a review of the plan at least annually. I presume that means the action plan, although it doesn't explicitly state. So I'm just trying to get my head around the difference. Okay. Uh, well, well the, the, the position is that these uh, bodies, the enterprise uh, agencies, are required to review their corporate plans every three years. And what I'm putting to the committee is that it makes sense 
that since the enterprise agencies do require themselves to collaborate, very often there are issues which transcend boundaries, for example, uh, companies operating in different parts of Scotland getting help from one enterprise agency, agencies very often have to collaborate. It makes a lot of sense that there should be alignment in their corporate plans and the timing of those so that the three-year cycle is effectively the same. Uh, that will require a little bit of uh, synchronisation, if that's the right word, but you know that, that can readily be achieved. I do think that a one-year requirement is too frequent and it would impose a significant burden on the agency and on those consulted. And just one specific point I want to make about that, which is this, that if, and I get the sense that this will happen, that Ms Watt's amendments will be accepted by the committee, then bear in mind that her Amendment 39 imports an obligation to consult where a plan is being modified. Now, if Mr Smith's proposal to review a plan every year is accepted, then one must accept that if a plan is to be reviewed, then the corollary is that there must be the the, the opportunity that it be modified as a result of that review. In order to modify it, there needs to be a consultation. That would import an annual round of consultations. The consultation process is not straightforward, so that, I think, would impose um, an unduly burdensome process. I'm sure Mr Smith doesn't wish to do that, and therefore I just wanted to make that point. That if members are minded to accept Ms Watt's amendments, then I, I do urge members not to accept the one-year review suggestion from Mr Smith. Can I just, I'll, I'll, in a moment, just to, just to make one final point. If Mr Smith is agreeable not to press these amendments, um, I'm happy to undertake, convener, to bring something back at stage three, which uh, creates the provision for an aligned three-year cycle so that we have clarity on these matters and if I'm permitted, convener, to give way to Mr Carson, I will do so. I'm Thank sorry. you, Cabinet Secretary. I, th I think it was quite uh, a, a, a simple question. Is there an expectation or a written-down guide or policy to as to what a review, uh, the, uh, how extensive a review requires to be? Well, I think, I, I, I'm not sure that there is, although I come back to the member if I'm incorrect, but I think, by definition, if one agrees that there should be a review of a plan, then the review would, of necessity and by definition, encompass the whole plan. Um, if, by contrast, there was to be a partial review, I think that would really need to be specified. If a bill says there has to be a review of a plan, then by definition, all of the plan falls to be reviewed. And also, by definition, the outcome of that review must have the opportunity to modify that plan. And if that were to happen, then... Um, that would entail a duty to consult every year. I think that, I think that would be an unreasonable burden. If, if so minded, convener, I'm uh, happy to take further amendments from anybody. If, if this, the, the Enterprise Board had to continually review and then go out to consultation, because people would then say that they hadn't consulted on a, their particular plan and they hadn't uh, went to the local people to consult. And that's one of the reasons why we want to establish the, the, South, the, uh, the Scotland Enterprise Board is to improve things. Would it not be, would they not get mired in a lot of um, paperwork, a lot of meetings, a lot of time spent? And that whole year could be away. Well, I think there's, there's merit in what Mr Lyle says. I think we, and plans are important, but implementing plans are even more important. Doing the job which the body is expected to do is what we all wish to see and it's by how it does that job it will be judged not I suspect by the content of its plan no, no matter how perfectly worded and comprehensively drafted so um, I encourage members in conclusion convener to support Maureen Watts amendments I would invite Mr Smith not to press his uh, amendments and I refer to the undertakings which again I've given this committee thank you cabinet secretary Colin Thank you very much, Convener. Um, there's certainly been a lot of comments made um, and a lot of assertions made on some of the amendments that are being proposed, and I, and I have to say many of those assertions um, do not reflect either the wording of the amendment or uh, the practical implementation of what that amendment would mean. For example, uh, the Amendment 29 requiring a, a review of the plan at least annually. It doesn't say the plan has to be modified. It doesn't say the plan has to be changed. If I'll take an intervention on that. Yeah. If you're going to have a review... Sorry, sorry Richard, just, I was slightly 
calling your name. It meant the mic was slow coming on. So, sorry, my fault. Okay. Please, please, please carry on. Thank the member for taking inter intervention. If you're going to ask for a, an, a, a review annually, you know, you, no new Colin Smith, you would be asking that local people would be consulted. So, if we're going to spend, you know, if they would spend the point I made to Cabinet Secretary earlier, if you're going to spend time consulting and go out to review and holding public meetings, and we've all held them and we've all been at them, and we know how long it takes to, to get a, a view together. I think annually, if you're going to do that annually, you're going to waste a lot of time. Thank you, Colin. The, the, the requirements on consultation are the requirements that would be, for example, set out in this bill. And um, I'll, I'll come to Maureen Watts' amendment in a second. It makes no reference whatsoever to consulting every single time the board would review um, their, 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 their action plan. If they were modifying it and changing it, as what Maureen Watts' amendment says, then certainly there would be a requirement for consultation. But the wording does not say when it's being reviewed. And the simple point I would make is this. Highlands and Islands Enterprise publish an annual operating plan. The one I've got in front of me says operating plan 2018-2019. It's an annual plan that they set out every single year. And I'm at a loss as to why people think that is something that shouldn't be pursued in the south of Scotland, where there's an annual plan, but it's something that happens in the highlands and islands. And, and I'm, I'm confused. I'll, I'll take an intervention on that. Yeah. Uh, Chair, Thank, thank you. Um, I, I, said, I, I said at the outset I'm sympathetic to this idea of an annual review of the plan. I think it's a, it's a, a bona fide request of an agency. But I do, having listened to the debate, have a subsequent concern that if, because I do support Maureen Watts Amendment 39 on the consultation of the action plan, and I, I do worry that we do, and I don't want to end up in a position where I've supported both, but we're left in a situation where the plan is reviewed annually and has to be consulted on. Annually. Now, even if that, as you've said, that means there's no modification to the plan because that's the view of the board, it's a perfectly acceptable view to have. But if they've had to go through the consultation process, which I think is a, a right and due process, before that decision is made, then this will become into the onerous task that I said it wouldn't be in my, my opening comments. So I, I, I am in a, a, a difficult position on that, and I'd hope we can... I think, I think every member is addressing this from an important angle, but I'd like to think this is a stage two, therefore I hope we can get this right at stage three. So I, I do wonder if there's a better way we could, as a committee, reflect on all the, the very valid points that are made and come back with something that works at stage three. Uh, Colin. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important that because we are in a, a kind of um, debate at the moment that, that, that is inventing all sorts of myths as to, first of all, what consultation should look like. In my view, uh, any organisation should be consulting on an ongoing basis. That happens at the moment with the, the current predecessor to the South Scotland Enterprise Agency. They carry out regular discussions, consultation meetings across the south of Scotland. They've done one set already. They're only in their second year and they're about to carry out um, a, a similar process this year. So the idea that, that somehow consultation is a very prescribed uh, view is, is not something that I'm setting out anywhere in my amendments. And I don't think anybody is. It's up to the new agency to, to set out how they plan to, to consult. It's not something that that's, uh, we're prescribing here, and therefore it shouldn't be uh, an onerous task. But I come back to the point again that, that Maureen Watt is not, is not proposing that um, there is a consultation process every single time um, the, the annual action plan is, is reviewed and, and I make the point again that the Highlands and Islands have an annual operating plan um, and I'm a wee bit at a loss as to why we shouldn't have that in Southern Scotland. Yeah, I'll take an intervention. Yeah. Um, thank you. Sorry, so, Ross. Thank you, Convener. So far, um, we've had four different um, descriptions or, or terms as to what this plan is. It's been a strategic plan, it's an operating plan, it's a corporate plan and it's an action plan. Are these all the same thing, or are they different things? And what is it that we're actually being... Because the HIE on the operating plan, is that different from an action plan, or would it be a corp... <coughs> I'm, I'm a bit confused as to the terms that are being interchangeably used. Have to, you would have to ask the, the Cabinet Secretary why the phrase action plan is the one specified in the legislation before us, but that's what is described uh, in the South Scotland Enterprise Bill, an action plan. It's not my language, it's, it's a language of the people who wrote the bill and, and they specify an action plan, so I can only go on the basis of the language that's used in the bill before us, therefore that's why we're referring uh, to the action plan and, and obviously that language is different from the legislation um, that established the, the, the Highlands and Islands. Enterprise Agency. Um, so I think it's perfectly reasonable to ask 
um, the, the agency to, to review its plan on an annual basis. And I think that's very different from saying it has to modify its plan on an annual basis. That would very much be a decision for the, uh, the new agency. Um, Colin, would you take an intervention from yeah, me? Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Just to, to try and add a bit of clarity on this, I, I too am confused in the plans. And, I, and I've noticed from what the Cabinet Secretary said that, that there is some willingness to discuss this. I mean, to me, it seems appropriate that we try and get a plan right that isn't a plan for a plan for a plan mm -hmm. to be reviewed on a reviewed, reviewable basis or annually or on a set period of five years. The plan must suit purpose. I, I, I personally would favour, and I wonder if you would support me in, in getting the Cabinet Secretary to draw up a, a, a process at stage three to ensure that the plan was appropriate and reviewed at the appropriate time, which then could be discussed at stage three. It's a very point I, I was coming to, convener, that there are two aspects to, to what's being um, proposed. There's the requirement to review the plan, but there's also a requirement to make sure that changes are made to that plan or it's modified at a certain upper period uh, of time. And as I said earlier, that's the precedent for that is in the forestry strategy, where as a committee we supported um, an amendment to that bill that came from the government that said that the forestry strategy had to be uh, modified after a set period. And the wording I've got here uh, around my modifying of, of the action plan is exactly the same wording. Timescale is different, but exactly the same wording um, as the forestry um, strategy. I would support a, a process coming forward. What I'm concerned about is that there is currently no timescales within um, the bill before us, um, and therefore that's what my main concern is. So I think it's perfectly reasonable um, to have that debate if there is a commitment there that says we'll bring forward proposals at stage three um, to set timescales and, and requirements on the new agency as to when it reviews its plan and um, when that plan has to be modified um, if there aren't any changes. I set five years because I think it would be it would be astonishing if we had an action plan from the new agency that wasn't modified at all within a five-year period, given how changing the, the, the economy is. Um, so um, it's certainly a, a, a view that I share in, in the comments that the convener makes. Um, just specifically on, on, on a couple of other points, um, in terms of a Maureen Watts amendment, the, the one slight concern I've got over the wording of the amendment is it talks about consultation before making or modifying its action plan. And I think that's quite restrictive. Um, it means that we would only consult, the agency would only consult, first of all, when it's making its action plan at the start of the process, or if it was modifying its plan. Um, and I think that's, I, I think my view is consultation needs to be a more <coughs> ongoing process. Um, so I'm happy to support that amendment, but I, I believe that the wording should be looked at in more detail to make sure that um, it's not just at a certain period of time when they modified the plan, because that could be five, ten years down the line. Um, uh, it should be something that's a, a more regular basis. So I'm concerned about, about the specific wording within that, although I'm, I'm happy to support that um, at this moment in time. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary made the point that um, I was aiming to have a veto on the action plan by the local authority. I would stress there are two amendments in my name. There's Amendment 32 and there's Amendment 33. Uh, one of those amendments talks about having regard for the comments of the local authority. That's not a veto. No lawyer is going to tell you having regard for something is a veto on it. So I think it's, it's important we don't mislead people by implying that that amendment gives the local authority uh, a veto over the action plan. It purely says they have a, uh, they should be consulted on and the agency should have regard for the comments from the local authority. I'll certainly take an intervention here. Richard Lyle, Richard. Well, you're saying that Scottish ministers must make by regulation make provision of how the south of Scotland enterprise proceed with a draft or draft modification of its action plan is rejected by the local authority. If I don't think, uh, you know, if you don't think that the local authority is going to try and interject on the um, the Scot South of Scotland Enterprise Board. I'm sorry, Colin, I, I certainly disagree with you because that, to me, is, is something that the local authority w could possibly do. And I would, in, in finishing, if a cabinet secretary was saying to me, I will, I will work with you to try and uh, sort out what you're asking for, I would be t grasping that as soon as possible and, and removing my... Amendment. So I would, I would ask you not to press any of them. I would ask you to work with the Cabinet Secretary to get what you want, because that's what we all want. I'm, 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 you know, I'm happy to take advice from Ms. Mr Lill at any opportunity, but I think it's important that we don't mislead the committee uh, based on what Mr Lill said there, because I'll come back to the point that there are two amendments, and I made very clear in my comments that one was an alternative to the other. So there is one amendment, 
that would provide the local authority with the opportunity to decide whether they agreed with the action plan. And that's exactly the same as the situation that happens at the moment with the police and with the fire service. So that's a law that Mr Lell supported when it came to the local plan for the police and the local plan for the fire service. The weakness in that piece of legislation is that if there is a dispute, there is no um, resolution process, and it's a point the Justice Committee made recently. So what I'm saying is if we went with that amendment, there would have to be a resolution process. However, Amendment 33 is an alternative to Amendment 32, and Amendment 33 doesn't give the local authority a veto over the action plan. It simply requires the local authority to be consulted and for their comments, to, for the agency to have regard for the comments of the local authority. Now, nobody is suggesting and surely that having regard for the comments of the local authority is somehow giving the local authority a veto. So it's important that there are two amendments there effectively given the committee options, and I think that's an important point that needs to be bear in mind. Yeah. Secretary, yes. I, I, I was arguing that section uh, amendment 37 in the name of Mr Smith would have the potential consequence of conferring a veto on local authorities. And the reason that I made that point is if one looks at the wording of Amendment 37, it specifically says that where a local authority rejects uh, the uh, plan or a draft or a draft modification of the plan, then Scottish ministers must by regulation make provision for how uh, South of Scotland enterprise is to proceed. So what happens is there's a draft plan put forward by SOSI, local authority rejects it, then Scottish ministers, the Scottish government, must then tell the agency what to do. I don't recall anybody in any of the consultation process suggesting that the Scottish government should step in and have the power as set out in Amendment 37, basically to direct uh, the, the new agency about what to do in those circumstances. So I, just to explain, perhaps I didn't fully explain it, convener, that was how I interpreted Amendment 37 and why I would suggest that it not be accepted by... Well, I, I don't think I can because I'm not the Speaker. Right. Smith. Sorry, sorry. Hold on. I'm going to have to let Colin come back, but I, I, I am getting to the stage where we are debating, I think, in a circular motion round, round these various motions. So I'm close to coming to a stage where saying that I think it's time to, for, for Colin to, to either press or withdraw the amendment so we can look at the other one. So, Colin... I'd like to come yeah. back to you, and, and if you feel appropriate to let Richard... I think it's important to um, respond to the Cabinet Secretary's point there. Amendment 37 is in direct reference to Amendment 33. So if we did go down the route, which is the same with police and fire service, of allowing the local authority to decide whether they agreed with the action plan or not, then my view is there should be a resolution process because that is one of the current major weaknesses uh, in the legislation on police and fire where there is no resolution process. If a local authority disagreed with the local plan for the police service, there is no process. And, and I come back to the point the Justice Committee made very clear they thought that was wrong and are asking the government to change that. So, number 30, so Amendment 37 is in direct reference to Amendment 33, but the alternative amendment and I make this point again, is that rather than allowing the local authority to have a vote or a, say, a, a veto on the action plan, that they simply are allowed to comment on the action plan and those, the, the, the agency should have regard for those comments. So number 32 is an alternative to 33, and number 37 is purely um, a, 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 an amendment that would be, be moved if Amendment 33 uh, was moved. So I think it's important to, to place that um, on, on record, um, convener. Yeah, I'll take an intervention, yeah. Um, now, hold on, sorry, with the greatest respect, uh -huh. if members want to intervene, this is critical stage two legislation as far as I'm concerned, Absolutely. and it's right if members want to intervene, and if the members are prepared to listen to them that, that, and, and take the intervention that they should. So, Colin, it's up to you whether you want to take in Mr Lyle, and then I'm going to ask you to, to, yeah. to wind up formally on, on this amendment. Uh, happy to take the intervention, Convener. You know, you've just explained what you've said. You've got two counter amendments. But I still come back to what's written in 37. You know, it says if the Council objects, it has to go back to Scottish ministers. That, that is, surely is not the intention. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, basically, uh, I again would say to you, you know, if you're getting uh, the good grace by the Cabinet Secretary to say, let's work on this. I would suggest that you work on it. 
to, to work on the amendments. What I'm not happy is that people keep making references to amendments that, frankly, are not accurate. Amendment 37 is in direct reference to 33. Yes, there should be a resolution process if there is a dispute, if Amendment 33 was carried. Uh, and I come back to the point, it's a very, the very point the Justice Committee made recently over the current legislation on police and fire service. So if Amendment 33 was carried, Amendment 32 would provide a resolution process. But what I'm saying is that there's an alternative to Amendment 33, which is Amendment 32. It doesn't require a resolution process. Yeah, I'm take, happy to get uh, uh, this, And, and I, I am going to say this is the last intervention. I mean, I think as he has gone on, uh, he has shown why it's important that we have flexibility and balance. Um, the way Colin Smith is, is speaking, um, you feel that the enterprise agency is going to be bound up in consultation all the time. It's very important to have consultation on the initial strategic plan and in any f flexibility that needs to be built into that. But otherwise, they need to be getting on uh, with the job rather than constantly out at consultation, which I feel his amendments uh, bind the, the uh, Enterprise Board in doing. And Colin, I, I am now going to ask you to very briefly summarise and then press or withdraw your amendment, please. I've certainly been trying to summarise for some time now, convener. I think it's important to, to point out that people's interpretation of the amendments is, is certainly slightly different from the actual wording in those particular amendments going forward. i um, happy to leave it at that, convener. I think what's really important is the principle that is missing from the current bill, which is the need to consult with the community in the south of Scotland. That's a major weakness in the bill as it stands. Uh, and I think uh, you know we can we can find a way between now and, and I hope stage three if there's a commitment from the government to find wording that actually meets that particular requirement, which so far has, has certainly been missing. Thank you, Colin. So I'm going to ask you now to press or withdraw Amendment 29, please. Uh, I'm quite happy to um, withdraw Amendment 29. Thank you. Therefore, as Colin Smith seeks to withdraw Amendment 29, I have to ask, does any member object? No. As a no objections, the amendment is withdrawn, and therefore I'd like to move on to Amendment 30 in the name of Maureen Watt, already debated with Amendment 29. Maureen Watt, to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question, therefore, is Amendment 30 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 31 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 29. Colin Smith, to move or not move? I'm happy to withdraw the, 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 the amendment or not move at this stage. So the, it's not, the amendment is not moved. Therefore, I call Amendment 32 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 39. To Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, not move um, based on the commitment to, to look at what done as we go towards stage. Okay, thank you. The amendment therefore is not moved. I therefore call amendment 33 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with amendment 29. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, not move. The, move. the amendment is not moved. I therefore call amendment 34 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with amendment 29. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, not move. Convenient. Thank you. The amendment is not moved. I therefore call amendment 35 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 29. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, again, convened with the commitment to, to look at word and stage three would not move. This Thank stage. you. The amendment is not moved. Therefore, I call Amendment 36 in the name of Maureen Watt, already debated with Amendment 29. Maureen Watt to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question, therefore, is Amendment 36 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 37 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 29. Colin Smith to move or not move? Not move, convener. The amendment is not moved. Therefore, call Amendment 38 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 29. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, again, not move at this stage with the commitment to look at word in its stage three. Thank you. Therefore, the amendment is not moved. The question, therefore, is... Uh, that section six be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I call Amendment 39 in the name of Maureen Watt, already debated with Amendment 29. Maureen Watt to move or not move? Moved. Uh, therefore, the question is that Amendment 39 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Therefore, going to call amendment in the name of Colin Smith. But before I do, can I just say there are a series of amendments all in their own group here. Um, and therefore, uh, I'm sure we can be focused particularly on them. So, calling on Colin Smith uh, to call amendment, sorry, calling amendment 40 in the, in the name of Colin Smith in a group on its own. Colin Smith to move and speak to amendment 40. 
Thank, thank you very much, Convener. Um, this amendment um, creates a, a duty for the agency to develop an equality strategy as part of their action plan and to report against it on a, a regular basis. Uh, I believe this agency has an important role to play in tackling inequalities, and I believe we need an element of oversight and accountability on their work in this regard. The strategy, and crucially, the requirement to report against it will provide that. Uh, in setting up a new agency, we should be doing all that we can to embed best practice from the onset, and that includes requiring them to produce an equalities strategy. Again, I've tried not to be overly prescriptive in what exactly this should involve, uh, so to give the agency um, uh, flexibility. Producing strategies and, and reports of this nature is something that's relatively common practice. Skills Development Scotland, for example, report regularly on progress with regards to equalities. This amendment will require the agency to proactively think through what they can and should do in this regard, set out specific plans and crucially be accountable in their progress, all of which are highly likely to improve how these agencies are handled and the priority they are given within this agency. This should be best practice in organisations of this kind and as a result I think it should be specified on the face of the bill. And, uh, I'm going to move directly therefore to the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. I, uh, let me reassure the committee convener that equality will be integrated into all the new agency does, but essentially my argument here is that what is being sought is already in law. Uh, once established, the agency will be added to the list of public bodies that are regulated by Section 149 of the Equality Act 2010. Uh, the public sector equality duty will automatically apply to the agency because the Scottish Government will make the necessary consequential legislative changes as soon as possible after the Bill is passed. That's the normal practice, but because it's linked to convener to reserve legislation, we can't do that through Schedule 2, as we've done for other legislation. It's not within the Parliament's legislative competence so to do. All public authorities in Scotland are already required to produce reports on mainstreaming quality. This amendment would place an additional reporting requirement on a new body, which is neither necessary nor proportionate, but I will undertake to give further consideration to how we make clear the importance of equality and tackling inequality as part of the agency's work, as I appreciate fully the point that uh, uh, Mr Smith uh, is seeking to make here. For those reasons, I hope he won't press his amendment, and if he does, I would ask members not to support it. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Colin Smith, can you wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please? Th thank you, Convener. I think it's important to point out that what this amendment is stating is not um, currently something within law, because it, it's quite specific uh, about the role of the new agency. So, for example, it states that the action plan uh, of the agency must include a strategy setting out how the South of Scotland enterprise will comply with its duties under the Equality Act and promote equalities in pursuing its aims. So, it very specifically asks for that to be included in its action plan uh, and also to report on particular performance. So, that's very different from what the law currently states. There's no requirement for the agency to set that out specifically within its action plan. Uh, however, I'm, I'm happy to, to take on board the comments that the Cabinet Secretary has taken that, that we should look at this to see how we can be more specific in the role of the agency um, going forward and, and hopefully that will see an amendment um, or a, a very clear process from the government uh, ahead of stage three. So do you wish to press or withdraw your amendment? I'll withdraw at this stage in that commitment. Thank you. So as Colin Smith wished to withdraw amendment uh, 40, does any member wish to object? No. No sure. member wishes to object, therefore the amendment is withdrawn. I'm now going to call Amendment 41 in the name of John Finney and a group of its own. John Finney to move and speak to Amendment 41. John. Um, thank you, Convener. And I, I do move the amendment in my name, and that is about powers not to be used to contribute to the arms trade. Now, a lot's been made about the, the comparisons with Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and Highlands and Islands Enterprise does not have this um, power at the moment. I made a number of inquiries with Highlands and Islands Enterprise to establish what monies they had provided to the arms uh, sector, and I got a reply detailing several companies, some of them receiving substantial um, six-figure sums, um, following which I had a meeting with the chief executive of Highlands and Islands Enterprise. And I, I want to be fair and balanced, as ever, on matters and, and make it quite clear that, for instance, if you own a company that makes batteries then that battery might go in you and my car, but that battery might also go in a tank. Just because you're making batteries doesn't mean that you're necessarily involved in the arms trade. So there is very much a, a distinction there. And I have to say, um, the, the members will be aware that um, 
both myself and the previous session and Green College in this session have asked a number of the questions uh, around this. Um, and most recently, my colleague Ross Greer asked a question which drew the unequivocal reply from the Scottish Government and very reassuring reply. The Scottish Government, and I quote here, the Scottish Government has not used public money to support the manufacture or export of munitions from Scotland. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a very clear statement. It's very unfortunate that the next sentence begins with the words, however, we recognise the vital role the aerospace, defence and marine engineering sectors plays in Scotland's economy. So, um, having taken reassurance from the meeting with the Chief Executive of Highlands and Islands Enterprise, I was therefore surprised, and this won't come as a surprise to you, um, Convener, because I'm sure along with uh, Ms Ross you will have received it too. I, very, just, I think it was the following week I received an invitation to, and I quote, the free workshop that will be held at the Inverness campus inviting local businesses to find out how the region can benefit from opportunities in aerospace, defence, security and space industries organised by Highlands and Islands Enterprise. And ADS, which is Scotland-based branch of Aerosmith Defence, Security and Space Industry organisations. Um, so we've heard repeatedly fine words from the, the Scottish Government where they, they talk about uh, the, uh, the UN Sustainable Goal 16 on peace, justice and strong institutions. Um, and they were asked about the assessment that's been made in relation to this. Um, people may well ask where the definition comes from. It's, it comes from um, the, um, if I can find my paperwork here, it comes from the um, Swedish, yes, I think it's in Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Um, it's very clear, it's very clear. There, there are finite public resources and public resources there are available to be spent in the south of Scotland should be directed to constructive, um, productive uses that benefit the whole of humanity, particularly the people of the south of Scotland. So uh, I'm optimistic that Scottish Government members will, given all these previous pronouncements, will have no difficulty lending their support to this very modest proposal. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. Uh, Mike Rumbles, uh, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Mike. Uh, thank you, convener. Just so the public are aware who are listening to this should know a little bit about my background. I'll preface that by saying that um, I've spent 15 years in the army, at both at home and abroad, <coughs> um, involved in military aid of the civil power and other issues. So I would like, rather than what John has just done, to talk about um, the arms trade, to talk about his amendment, because the arms trade is not what his amendment is about. The, the arms trade is a serious subject which is, deserves to be treated seriously, but this amendment doesn't do that. The amendment doesn't treat this issue seriously um, because what the amendment does, it would lead to serious situations facing the people of the south of Scotland. Um, in the definition to which John refers to, it refers to both domestic procurement, sales and domestic procurement, then in the further definition it talks about anything to do with operational support. So if there was, God forbid, a crisis in the south of Scotland, just to give one example, if this passed into law, this would prevent the agency working with any other organisation or body to support the military aid given to the civil power in an emergency. This is, in my view, an irresponsible amendment and we should have nothing to do with it. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, followed by Jeremy Green. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, right at the top of this amendment, South Scotland Enterprise may not do anything which contributes financially to the arms trade. Um, that is an all-encompassing definition, uh, which um, creates substantial difficulties. Um, and I'll come back to it in a second. Um, Moving on to 3B and uh, the definition of military services, services specifically provided support military purposes. Uh, but then, it go, it, it, in, including information technology. Now, that would certainly appear to be uh, the case where um, the military buy they, they, they go into a computer, a computer retailer and they buy some software to run on a PC. That is information technology and it is specifically provided support military purposes. So, you know, it's a definition. Um, 
including intelligence. Well, I actually want the intelligence services um, to, uh, to continue to do the job they do, the security services, sequent intelligence services. In 1967, I was a laundry van driver. Uh, one of my customers uh, was a GCHQ outstation where I took the roller towels in and collected the soiled roller towels on a weekly basis. Uh, that would be supporting the intelligence services um, and uh, it presumably would contribute to their financial viability. Training. Well, one of the important parts of training that I think John Finney would wish to support is training that relates to diversification of companies who are currently involved in the arms business into civilian. So the providing of training uh, that would help diversification would appear to be uh, something uh, that would be banned. I think without seeking to particularly engage in the principle that I think John is, is trying to address, the construction of the amendment creates very real difficulties, that it would be all but impossible for um, the South of Scotland Enterprise or indeed any other enterprise agency uh, to comply with this specific warning. Convener. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Um, in the interest of time, I don't think this amendment uh, merits a uh, huge swaths of, of our time, but I think it's an important point to address. I can, can commend Mr Finney for using uh, this uh, bill to make his point. I think he's made his point very well, but I think it's, uh, in terms of amendments, go erring uh, uh, on the side of bonkers. Um, let's look at some of the strategic small local SMEs uh, that, that operate in the south of Scotland that will really look towards this agency for assistance. I point to companies like Penman uh, in Dumfrieshire who make armoured vehicles for military services. What, what would happen if they approached this agency and said we need support to expand and develop our, our business and employ more local people or take on more apprenticeships? And this amendment restricts the agency from dealing with companies like that. I mean, it, we just can't have that situation. So I think you know, Mr Finney's made his point uh, around his views on, on, on the arms trade, but unfortunately the amendment is so uh, all-encompassing. It includes things like logistic support and facilities management to our military services, which could mean anything. It could mean the production of UHT milk for forces and squaddies. It could be, you know, people making woolly jumpers in the borders. So, I mean, I, I, it's you know, with all respect to the member, um, I, I can't see how the committee could support an amendment which restricts so many small and medium-sized businesses which could or do operate in the south of Scotland. The agency should be arms open and all-encompassing. Uh, Richard no. Richard. Yeah, thank you. I would love to live in a world where people didn't supply arms to other people to kill people. But that, sadly, is the world that we live in. And I, I think that Mr Finney's putting across about the arms trade. To me, that's guns, planes, bombs, whatever, you know. What about tyres on a plane that's maybe getting made down the south of Scotland? What about plastic that's getting made down there? What about anything that goes into a vehicle, a plane, or personal equipment? You know, the point you were saying about, you know, uh, maybe going to the Arctic, so they need uh, a type of a jumper or, or undergarment that, that, that's made in the south of Scotland. You know, John, I agree with you, Mr Finney. I agree with you in regards to the supply of arms. I wish it would stop but sadly it won't, and uh, this my amendment does they cut it, and I won't be supporting it. Thank you, Richard. Uh, John, briefly. No, you're fine. Uh, Finn Clark, briefly. Thank you, Convener. I just, I just want to strongly urge the committee to reject this amendment. As, as Jamie Green has already mentioned, we've got a successful company uh, based on free making specialist and armoured vehicles, which is a, a fantastic example of... Uh, into enterprise and entrepreneurial behaviour in, in the south of Scotland and it would be dreadful to think that an amendment like this might uh, restrict that company's ability to grow and employ people. Okay. And, uh, I, I briefly uh, would, like, would like to make a comment is that operational support for the armed services, one needs to be very careful that the armed services, and I speak from experience, are sometimes deployed on peacekeeping and, and to deny the ability to carry out peacekeeping I, I think would be detrimental. That would be a sec second point I'd mention is that there are soldiers deployed in preventing poaching in Africa, 
which would be operational support, you'd be denying them. And I, I am not sure that, that that is what you intend to do. Um, but that is the way, in my mind, the amendment is written. And for that reason, I won't be supporting it. Cabinet section. No, sorry, I should have made. Okay. Um, just to say, I'm a committee member of the Highland Reserve Forces and Cadets Association. I'm sure as you don't receive any remuneration no. for that, that would be fine. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I'm going to call you in and then I'm going to come back to John Finney. Um, as the First Minister has made clear, the Scottish Government and its enterprise and skills agencies do not provide funding for the manufacture of munitions. Our agency's support is focused on helping firms diversify and develop non-military applications for their technology. Our enterprise agencies do not support the manufacture of munitions, but they do recognise the importance of aerospace, defence and marine sectors in Scotland, which, for example, employ many young graduates in STEM subjects. So they work proactively with these sectors to help them diversify their activities and grow and sustain employment. That position, convener, would apply to the new agency as well. Mr Finney's amendment would, however, penalise businesses applying for such. It would also impact on small businesses which dominate the rural economy in the south of Scotland and who may provide goods or services to main contractors, as I think Mr Green and Mr Lyle specifically pointed out. As the committee will be aware, there are companies in the south of Scotland that operate in the area of defence. The new agency should be able to support them with diversification and non-military applications for their technology. The defence, aerospace and marine sector in Scotland is very important to our economy uh, and if passed this amendment could damage the contribution that companies in this sector make, putting jobs in the south of Scotland and potentially elsewhere at risk. The new agency provides the opportunity to deliver a fresh approach and promote economic growth in a balanced way, able to support businesses in the area to establish and grow, as well as attracting inward investors. We want to ensure it has the flexibility to do that. For that reason, I would invite members not to agree to this amendment. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, and John Finney, uh, I'm going to invite you to wind up and press a withdrawal. Yeah, um, thank you very much indeed, Convener. And, and I thank members for their contributions. Um, I think members haven't read the motion, which of course is competent or it wouldn't be in front of you. And specifically, um, you know, Mr Rumble's comments uh, are incorrect, because of course the key phrase in the, the term military goods as set out in 3B, uh, A and B, is military purposes. So likewise your poaching issue, or likewise your woolly jumpers. Um, I think we need to get... Um, well, that's soldiers the, on military duty. Uh, uh, we need to get uh, the, 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 the terminology agreed there. Diversification, of course, is commendable. Absolutely commendable. And, uh, but still, you know, for instance, the Scottish Government gave two million to Lockheed Martin, a company who had made three and a quarter billion dollars profit uh, a couple of Novembers ago. Uh, it was dressed up as uh, money for uh, Glasgow University. Um, Raytheon have received money. Raytheon, of course, are complicit in the, the slaughter of innocent people in the Yemen, where there's a famine now. Now, um, everyone wants to encourage diversification. I, I, I thought it a bit surprising that um, Stuart, uh, Mr Stevenson said he wasn't seeking to engage in the principle. Well, the principle is behind this, and this is about opportunities. And if there's an opportunity to provide public monies to two bodies, <coughs> and one's involved in providing uh, a military uh, goods for military purposes, and one isn't, I hope the decision would be taken the other way. The evidence suggests that that's not the case. This was an opportunity to do something very modest. I hear what members said. I, I do wish to press the the motion, please. Thank you, uh, Mr Finney. Um, so the question I have to put at this stage is, uh, is Amendment 41 agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed, therefore there is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Uh, those against, please raise their hands. And those abstentions, please. Right, so the results of that vote is there was one vote for, there were nine votes against, there was one abstention, therefore Amendment 41 is not agreed. Can I ask the question that Section 7 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. The question, therefore, is that Sections 8 to 13 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Thank you. 
at the outset of this meeting, I did say that we aim to complete stage two today, but I did say that we'd see how we get on. Unfortunately, it is clear that we are not going to be in a position to complete the rest of stage two, and that we have got as far as we are able to go today. Therefore, we will have to pick up next week uh, where we've left off today. Could I remind members that amendments... Sorry, if I could remind members that amendments to the remaining sections of the bill can still be lodged, and the deadline for doing so is 12 noon tomorrow, the 9th of May. Um, I would like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for attending today. And I would also like to point out that we had other items on our agenda, which unfortunately we are unable to get to as well. So therefore, they will be rescheduled. I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance uh, today and look forward to the early start of the committee meeting next week. And I therefore close this.